Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Circe workshop by Yale Mail Clinic on artificial intelligence and causality, estimating heterogeneous treatment effects, interpretability, and explainability. I am Jenny Lee, uh, Associate Director for RWE from Office of Civilian Epidemiology, the moderator of this workshop. Uh, Dr. Liu, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Jenny, and good morning, everyone. My name is Chi Liu. I'm the Associate Director for Innovation Partnership in Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA. Welcome to today's workshop. Thank you for your participation, and I hope we will all have a great time today. Thank you. Great. Um, I will give a, a brief opening remark, and then uh, Dr. Liu uh, will introduce our three speakers for today. Next slide, please. This is a disclaimer. Next one. Uh, this is the agenda for today's workshop. You can also find it in the meeting invite uh, of, this, uh, of the workshop. Um, next one, please. This is uh, some housekeeping rules and uh, it will be recorded and we'll share the link uh, of the recording and the slides after the meeting. Um, every, after every section, there will be a brief Q and A. Uh, please use the chat box um, to submit your questions. And uh, in the very end of the workshop, there will be more time for Q and A. Next, please. Uh, the purpose of this workshop is to discuss the relationships between uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and causal inference. We will cover uh, the basics of modern causal inference with AI and machine learning, but mostly uh, from the standpoint of heterogeneous effect, complex data structures, and interp interpretability and uh, um, explainability of the results. Uh, it will draw uh, algorithmic concepts of causality from current literature and ongoing research in this area. Uh, the application examples will be drawn from the ongoing Yale Mayo Clinic Circe project. Next, uh, so um, actually the slide before, thank you. Um, I'm an epidemiologist by training I'm not expert in uh, artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, yet facing an increasing number of uh, clinical studies, including uh, trials and observational studies, which employed uh, machine learning um, as one component of the study design. Investigators do see the need to gain better understanding of the technique and its impact on the study results when they're making clinical and uh, um, regulatory recommendations. Although AI and machine learning are well known for making predictions, the use for causal inference is relatively new to us. We can't wait for the Mayo Searcy clinic team to shed light on the subject. We FDA are specialized in assessing the data collected from clinical studies in support of efficacy and the safety claims. Sometimes we even try to reproduce the statistical results using the data submitted by the sponsors. The question we face now is how do we evaluate the results generated by AI? Do we need to look at the algorithm itself? How about the training data that went into the algorithm? given that it plays an important role in determining how the algorithm performs. So all these questions really motivate us today to be here to gain a better understanding of AI and machine learning and their application in clinical studies. Next, please. Uh, I wanna thank you. Uh, I wanna thank the Yale Mail uh, Clinic team for bringing us this interesting uh, presentations. I wanna thank you, um, uh, our FDA colleagues from different office in collaborating with us. With that, uh, Dr. Liu um, 
Would you like to introduce our uh, speakers? Thanks, Jenny. And um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's presenters. We'll have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Che Ningfor. Dr. Ningfor is an assistant professor of biomedical informatics and senior associate consultant at the Mayo Clinic, Robert D. and Patricia E. Kerr Center for the Science of Healthcare Deliver and the Department of Artificial Intelligence and Informatics. His main research, his main areas of research include computational mathematics, statistics, big data analytics, and causal inference, artificial intelligence, machine learning, virtual augmented, mixed reality, and high-end computing. Dr. Ningfo is passionate about developing, improving, and applying novel AI machine learning algorithms and disruptive technologies to solve complex clinical problems. Today, he will cover two topics. The first one is about the motivation for artificial intelligence and causality. And the second one is about causal machine learning estimators for heterogeneous treatment effects in observational data. Dr. Ningfor, please take it away from here. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I will share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see my screen, full screen? I, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Lee, thanks, Dr. Liu, for the great introduction. And uh, really, uh, I, I'm hoping by the end of this workshop, we could kind of address some of the issues that you mentioned at the top there. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with the motivation, but not really like a motivation of artificial intelligence per se, because it's really out there, but more so as a cautionary tale that really address one of the things that you also mentioned at the top and some of some thought provoking process as we go through learning causal inference with uh, machine learning. So the first thing about causality is that majority, if not all of the research questions are really causal in nature, but sometimes we frame it differently and we put it as a prediction problem. Take for example, this uh, article that appeared in the New York Times, what, <clears throat> drive success is really a close up when my, when my question in nature is ob obesity contagious. So if you really think about it, go back through your research and all the question hypotheses that you put forward, you see a cause and effect nature in that question. Then you ask your question, how did you go about solving that problem? Did you apply a theoretical causa and um, steps or did you use any other steps? So that's really one of the keys of causal inference. Now, we are living in a perilous time in a, in a sense that there's so much misinformation out there, so much uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, misinformation about vaccine, misinformation about election, almost everything that we care about this misinformation and disinformation about. And I would like, I'll say most of this is really driven by this uh, thing that we call correlation. And they are driven by inappropriate use of traditional statistical methods or data science methods that are making recommendations that are inappropriate. So if you see like, you know, saying that um, uh, <clears throat> sales increases because uh, there's an association with shaving heads, so we should shave heads. So we really need to look at the data and try to figure out what is the causal part that leads to those conclusions. I want to take a little step back about some of uh, some outrageous statements have been made recently with the advent of big data. One question that I'll ask here is, would the computer progress and big data indeed lead to the end of theory as we know it? It goes back to the first slide that I mentioned causation. With big data, there's almost, there's almost you can almost observe any um, pattern within the data. So with the, with the progress of big data and computers and lead to end of theory um, uh, as we know it, uh, you can make an argument for or against. One argument that you could potentially make for is, for example, look at the relationship, the Ohm's law, um, <clears throat> voltage is equal to current times resistance, or Newton's law is equal to mass times acceleration. Do we still need that 
kind of theoretical hypothesis again when we can have big data and we go through this massive amount of data and look for patterns to solve that problem do we still need to have that relationship again and again i'll just throw it back to you guys what would be your arguments against that we actually need that theory having that connection between the theory and the big data is one fundamental aspect that going as we move with math through the causal inference that we really need to unify and this slide was where you have it there's actually a link here that will lead you to one really thought-provoking um a conversation or commentary by um a fabio Musachi, and he's like saying that could big data be the end of theory in science as we know it i, I encourage you to look at look that up and make the judgment for yourself now we have data sets, which is really something um, that has come up and has really taken grounds in industry and academics. But what about data science and causal inference? Uh, we know health science is really littered with many cautionaries of the dangers of inappropriately inferring causality. But data science is actually vulnerable to the dangers of not knowing what it doesn't know. We've seen this, we've seen this with the misinformation, we've seen this with Facebook, we've seen, we, all these things are driven by inappropriate use of data science and statistical methods. So data science really need um, a causal inference to prevent data scientists from making, uh, making silly statements, making bias inference and recommendation that could be problematic, problematic if not actually dangerous. In, in that same sense, who needs who? Just data science need causal inference or causal, or, or how do we unify it? Big data is really useful for medical research, but if not used wisely, it can actually exacerbate the problem, as I just mentioned at the top there. Poor design, inappropriate method, careless assumptions. All these can make the problem worse. So more data will simply mean to inc inaccurate inference that makes it more, more acceptable. So we got to be careful. And again, I'll I invite you guys to check this link out. This is um, an interview by Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was actually one of the pioneers of machine learning and artificial intelligence. He's saying this, a lot of people are building things. What he said building things is machine learning models. A lot of people are building things and hoping they, are, they will work. And sometimes, really sometimes these things will work. And in some sense, there's really nothing about this. But society as a whole cannot tolerate that we can just hope for these things to work. Eventually, we will need accurate guarantees that this thing actually work. I mean, you're building models in um, Twitter or Facebook or things like that. I mean, you just hope that it's going to work and you use them to make recommendations. Eventually, as the data keep pouring, you will need guarantee that these things actually work so that you can use those um, uh, models to make recommendations. Again, there's really a, a, a kind of things that I want to draw everybody about, the interplay between causal, causality and predictive modeling. These two are different depending on the context that you're looking at it. Uh, causal modeling is really the application of statistical or data mining models for testing a causal hypothesis or cow, can we, can we, can we discover a causal relationship. For example, does healthcare insurance, does health insurance affect health care utilization. That is a causal problem that we saw at the top there. Predictive modeling, on the other hand, is the application of statistical or data mining algorithms to data for the purpose of predicting new or future observation. For example, the same question we predict next, next year healthcare utilization based on current insurance coverage. This There's always a conflation between these two, and I want to go a little bit further and have some thought-provoking questions that we need to rethink. Um, we mentioned that we also really want to cover the explainability of um, AI, but what is really explainability or um, uh, explanatory power? Explanatory power provides information about the strength of the underlying causal relationship. So if you have a predictive model, you can't really be talking about the explanatory power. Now the predictive power on the other side is the ability of a given model to produce good or plausible prediction for new observation. So explanatory and prediction are two different concepts. Now, two controversial questions that I want to let you guys in. Must a causal model have some level of predictive power to be considered as scientifically useful? This is a very interesting question that 
you can try to answer. You build a causal model and then you ask the question, must it have a level of predictive power to be scientifically useful? On the other hand, must a predictive model have a sufficient explanatory power to be scientifically useful? This one, in fact, is what we deal with every day. We build a prediction, a prediction model, and then we try to infer some causality about that prediction model. And that can really lead to some wrong inference. As you can see here, some of the practice that we need to really rethink when we build these models is that if this, the stated goal of an analysis is predictive, however, causal explanation is often employed. For example, you're trying to assess, assess the explanatory power of a prediction model that can lead to misleading inference. The next point actually causes this one too. Researcher try to validate a causal theory from a predictive model. And I've seen this in my research at Mayo Clinic more often than I would like to admit. A certain variable is not supposed to be relevant or important. I build a prediction model and we are looking at, you know, variable importance. Oh, this variable is up there, or oh, this variable is down there. It's not supposed to be like that. Something is wrong. But the, 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 the initial goal for that model was to predict new outcome. But now we are trying to infer some causality about that model. So those are things we need to sit back and rethink. However, could we bring causal and prediction together such that we build a model that is both predictive and causal in nature? This, this is one of my research that I'm working on. So a popular assumption, again, about the pre causal and prediction inference is that a model with high explanatory power are inherently of high predictive power. That could be true depending on the context, but most often it's false. So the goals of finding models that are predictably accurate differs from the goal of finding models that are true. Models that are true means you actually have the true causal nature of, uh, of, of, of that model. I would invite you again to check this link out here to explain or to predict. This actually brings the real theoretical foundation of what you want to explain or what you want to predict. And then this, the author Gary actually showed that a true model, a model that is built for prediction model can actually tend to be the wrong model in terms of making causal analysis. So the goals of causal and prediction modeling are different. Statistic is here to make a clear distinction between these two, but this distinction has a large impact on the steps of the statistical modeling process and on the appropriate use. So machine learning can help in that sense because we've seen how machine learning can access big data, can work with big data, can work with large hammer dimension, and they've shown a lot of predictive accuracy that, that are unprecedented. About machine learning in the causal inference, there are some limitations and you know, to be able to bring in causal inference into machine learning. What are some of the uh, assumptions about machine learning that we know? Uh, machine learning typically assume that when you build a model from a training set, that model is going to apply to the test set. So we assume that model will apply to new data that looks like the training data. This is often not the case, like the, the graph, the figure that you see there, you build an automatic um, uh, driving model on a training set that looks like a field, but in the real world, oh, you have things that are unprecedented same. So that's issue of generalizability as we are going to see in the conference talks today. Another issue that I just mentioned also is the explainability. Here lies really a gray line. We have the black box issue. That you felt about the black box, unable to explain the reason behind prediction or recommendation. Again, depending on your goals, if your goal was a prediction, you probably don't really need that explanation, but how about we bring together the causal nature and the prediction so that we understand the prediction and we understand the causal nature of the prediction. Another aspect which is key of human intelligence is the cause and effect. In human intelligence, we inherently know the cause and effect. To be able to build a generalized artificial intelligence, we need that cause and effect to be engraved in that model. Without that, we can never build a fully adaptive um, artificial intelligence system. However, in the past five years or so, there has been a tsunami of machine learning met methods that have been developed to address these challenges. In fact, sometimes I find it hard 
to present this uh, this this these topics because every day there's a method that has come up and addressing new I mean novel techniques to solve causal problems. There's really been a lot of research in this area, and I'll invite everybody that is have some interest in AI and machine learning to have a look in this method because this are the, I mean there's a really game changer out there. So about this uh, workshop in general, uh, the workshop will really focus on the basics of causal inference with machine learning and uh, for estimating heterogeneous treatment effect. In it, we are going to describe fundamental theory, uh, modeling choices, for example, how to train the model, which model to use, uh, opportunities and challenges in using observational data in both the cross-sectional and longitudinal settings. Uh, application example, we are going to pull from the current uh, Mayo Clinic, um, uh, year Mayo Clinic CERC projects. And then we're also going to see some advanced topics. So with that, uh, I will now move to the next topic. Uh, Dr. Liu, should I move to the next topic or do we need to, to do some questions? And... Hi, Dr. Ningfo. I, I think we have a few minutes that people can ask questions here, right? Jenny? Yes, if there is a question, we, we can. We do have some time. If not, we just proceed to the to the next section. I don't see anything in the chat box yet. Okay. Let me just give a quick moment again. Maybe I should ask. Uh, maybe I could ask a question sure. in the slide number eleven. Um, yes, thank you. So the causal and effect item, what, what do we mean a key element uh, is absent from pattern recognition system? Could you elaborate further? So, yep, exactly. No, thanks for that question. So traditionally, machine learning models have been built for prediction. They've never really got into question of course, what is the cause and effect of some intervention? We, it really is the point of predicting future observation. So that element of cause and effect is missing. And that's why I said in the next bullet point that, however, in the past five years or so, there's a lot of machine learning AI techniques that have been developed to address that cause and effect. And it has really boomed that some methods, I mean, as what I'm going to describe here, are really, really good so much that I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it because I think it's going to be a really game changer if they are used appropriately. Great, thank you. Um, should we start the, the next session? Excuse me, can I ask a question? Of course. Okay, this is a great topic. And then my question is, what is your causality means? Do you mean the association study or correlation study in the statistics? Well, what, what do you mean exactly your causality? This terminology, I, could you elaborate a little bit? What is the difference with you know, ex, you know, the traditional scientific unit you know, lab to find you know, the real, the cause? What I see from data, are you doing is just the unit you know, correlation study or unit you know, association study? And that is your terminology is a causality or not? If I not, what is it? Oh exactly. yeah, I, I, th I think I think th that's a great question, and I can go to answer that question by this uh, here, this figure that we said at the top here. Association. Now, association is really in line with prediction. Something is associated with another. There's no cause and effect here. When I say about cause and effect, is that we have an intervention, for example, and that intervention is responsible, is responsible for moving or for affecting an outcome. And the examples that we are going to see today, mostly drawn from our CC project, is that uh, is the, giving somebody an oral anticoagulant responsible for reducing or increasing the risk of an outcome, say stroke, for example. Now, the association here is that Maybe there's one factor in the data set that is associated with high or high or low risk, but that factor is not responsible 
is not responsible for increasing or lowering the risks. It could just be uh, noise in the data. It could just be some random aspect of the data generation process, but that factor is not responsible. So cause and effect is really something happens because something else happens. So that's the link about cause and effect. And that's what I'm saying that traditional machine learning, learning did not take into account that cause and effect, but just mainly as we're looking at um, a correlation. And really that's really why you see sometimes you have a lot of misinformation out here because it's really about that correlation. Correlation out there, people just look at that correlation. They're not looking into the cause and effect. Even when they look into the cause and effect, sometimes the methods are inappropriately used or maybe they just look at one look at the bottom line to improve profit, not appropriately used. Thank you. Great, okay, thank so, you. Okay, let's jump to our main. Okay. I hope everybody can see my slides. Okay, so, so the main uh, topic uh, for today here is a um, uh, causal machine learning estimating heterogeneous genome effect with observational data. Sorry, uh, we still see the slides, the correlation is enough one. Oh, okay. So I... How about now? Yep, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so today uh, we're given a talk on causal machine learning and uh, on estimating heterogeneous treatment effect with observational data. This is an interesting talk. Um, so typically when we talk about heterogeneous treatment effect, we know majority, if not all uh, research studies the data is heterogeneous. However, despite the presence of heterogeneity, many studies estimate the average treatment effect, or ATE. Uh, and this ATP is implicitly assumes that a similar treatment effect across heterogeneous patient population. Um, this ATE, if you're not eating this, an average patient. You have patients who may benefit, patients who may not benefit, or may be harmed by, and then you, we are looking at the average treatment effect. There's really no average patient. Uh, treatment effect within subgroups often vary considerably from the average treatment effect. So heterogeneity, heterogeneity of treatment effect is really that no random explainable variability in direction and magnitude of the treatment effect for individuals within that population. So what we really want to do is be able to find subgroups that differ in magnitude and direction of the treatment effect. That's really the goal of heterogeneous um, uh, analysis. In this talk, I'll mainly draw examples or try to use um, uh, examples from the CESI, um, uh, CESI um, uh, project, where we try to look at the effect of oral anticoagulant on outcomes like stroke, or cause mortality, or bleeding. So I'm going to use this hypothetical example every time. So we look, we have, for example, four patients, and we want to ask the question, which of oral antagonists, apixaban, debigatran, rivaroxaban, or warfarin is best for John, Mary, or Peter? And we want to really put that in the context of individual treatment effect or subgroup treatment effect. Now we are using observational data. Uh, observational data for it is really that you know, using observational data represents a really thriving area for, of research in which machine learning are really prime because they've shown that level of uh, be able to be used with high dimensional data set and they can produce very high prediction accuracy. So we have, for example, observational data about John, Mary, Peter, and Anne. We have the age, sex, the diagnosis condition, and so on. I want to apply a machine learning um, algorithm to try to identify the heterogeneity in treatment effect. For example, we want to compare two drugs, apixaban and debigatran, 
what, what we really want to do here is to look at that differential effect of apixaban with the, the debigatron with respect to some outcome, for example, stroke. And the, 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 that differential effect is really between the magnitude of the estimated risk of apixaban or debigatron with respect to that outcome. In that sense, we want to be able to move from there and estimate the individual treatment effect. At the population level, especially in the study that we, we, we did was that, we mostly found that apixaban is mostly effective across all other oral anticoagulants with respect to reducing risk of stroke, mortality, and, 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 and bleeding. However, it might be the case that some patient may benefit more from one other treatment or the other. So we want to look into that subgroup. So again, we use that observational data to try to tease out those differences. And again, what we found that is that there are some patients that will benefit more from apixaban or they'll benefit more from debigatron. But what we did find is that uh, no, on, across the board, majority of the patient did not benefit from warfarin. Warfarin tend to increase the risk of stroke, for example, or bleeding which is um, a kind of, you know, it was validated by the literature. But the interesting thing here is that at the population level, we found that apixaban is mostly effective. But when we compare apixaban and warfarin, we did find that warfarin and apixaban is mostly effective, but there were some subgroups where the effect was equivocal, whether it's warfarin or um, apixaban. That means those patients in those groups could benefit from some other and my oral anticoagulants. So that was really an interesting finding. Now, what we want to do is, you know, really discuss about, you know, observational data, but we have to, first of all, note that the gold standard of investigating um, uh, causal relationship is really from randomized control trial. We know the limitations of randomized control trial, but I'm not going to go too much into that, but Again, the small sample sizes, they are not representative, they're consuming expensive. Our observational data really provides us with that opportunity. However, prior to the popularity of data science and machine learning, there was a lot of skepticism about using observational data to conduct causal inference. But now given the flexibility and accuracy of this method, there's a lot of opportunities, or I mean, those opportunities are really boundless. So observational data provides you the treatment, the last sample sizes, but the treatment assignment is not random, as in um, uh, randomized control trial, but the population is representative. Analysis can be fast, simple, efficient, inexpensive. Again, it comes with its overall challenges. And throughout this workshop, we are going to be looking at those challenges. The structure of, of, of um, uh, um, uh, randomized control trial data and observational data are really different. And the main difference is about what we call the co-founding. In randomized control trial, there is no co-founding. You can do a randomized control trial where you're just looking at the effect of treatment on an outcome, or you may be looking at the randomized control trial where you want to look at the conditional effect of a patient clinical characteristics. But because there's that random assignment of treatment, there is no relationship between your clinical factors and the treatment. So in that case, you can estimate the individualized treatment effect or, or conditional average treatment effect. However, in observational data, you now have that there is this co-founding. Co-founding is really one of the biggest problem in applying machine learning algorithm. So causal inference from observational data is really that challenging because of this co-founding and bias. Bias here is about selection bias. And this assumption must be made to be able to overcome this challenge. We, we, we must make some as, um, assumption, as we are going to see. Two main approaches of machine learning algorithm in estimating heterogeneous treatment effect from observational data are causal graphical models or the potential outcome framework. Uh, this, we are not going to go more into the graphical model, but I'll just have to I'll highlight, briefly highlight, the graphical models. We are going to focus more on the potential outcome because that's where most of our research has been based. So the causal graph is really a probabilistic graphical model that is used to encode, encode assumption about causal relationship about the data generating process. One key aspect of the 
causal graph is really the Markov blanket. So you, you assume that your relation, your clinical factors are linked by some um, uh, directed acyclic graphs. For example, the, the graph that you see here. Now, the Markov blanket of a node or a variable is really the, 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 the area that you see that is shaded. You assume that if I know the parents of a node, if I know the children of a node and the co-parents of that node, that's the spouses, then every other observed um, uh, factor or clinical factor are independent. So all I really need is to know the parent, the co-parent and the children. That's sufficient for me to come across with that causal discovery or that causal part that link to that node. That node could be, for example, a treatment. If I know that there are certain factors that are related to my treatment and also related to my outcome, then I can just focus on the Markov blanket. That Markov blanket will produce me all those factors that are related to the treatment. Then I can, I can use those factors now to control for the, 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 the co-founding. Another important factor of the causal graph is the depression. The depression depression actually allows us to determine whether two sets of variables are independent given a third one. So this can be also applicable in the sense that if two medications are independent, then maybe I can find a hidden factor in my data set that when I know that hidden factor, then my two medications or two treatments are independent. So that's another factor that can be used to augment the potential outcome um, uh, framework. So that's it about the graphical causal models. There's a lot of machine learning algorithms that have been developed for the graphical models. In fact, there's more research about AI in causal graph than AI in potential outcome, but that balance is kind of changing now. So the potential outcome framework, and I'm gonna start here in the cross-sectional setting because our goal here is to present this method for both cross-section and hierarchical data. And the hierarchical data here is mostly longitudinal data with repeated outcomes. So the potential outcome framework is really the Robin or the Neyman, <clears throat> it can also be called the Robin or the Neyman Robin causal model. So in this framework, you have a treatment which is an action or intervention that is applied to each patient, for example. In the binary case, that is W is either zero or one, the treated group are assigned W is equal to one, while the control group or the untreated group uh, assigned W is equal to zero. Then of course you have an outcome, which is something that you're interested to look at. What is the effect of that treatment on the outcome? So the patient can, <clears throat> can have the outcome or not have the outcome. Then you have your observed data and in, in observational data, for example, electronic medical, medical records, this um, observational data actually depend on clinical practice. Clinicians will look at the patient, look at the cover before determining whether they apply uh, uh, a treatment or not. The clinician cannot close the eye and then apply a treatment. They use their experience. So that data is biased or has co-founding. So you have that selection bias issue and you have the co-founding. And that brings us to the propensity score, the propensity for treatment, which is the probability of the treatment given the observed code variant. So in the observational setting, any model that we have need to be able to learn in the presence of co-founding and bias, and in fact also learn in the presence of hidden co-founders. So how do we really go about you know, the potential outcome framework? The potential outcome framework allows us to define two potential outcomes. This is really the key, two potential outcomes. One of the outcome is called, you know, the actually observed outcome, which is the outcome where the treatment was given and why not, which is the present the patient outcome when, it, when not treated. So for each individual patient, you have two potential outcomes. Either when the treatment is given, you observe the outcome, or when the treatment is not given, you observe the outcome. You can never observe both. You can never observe both. And that's why we call it the counterfactual. You have the factual and then you have the counterfactual. Whenever you observe one, the other is hidden or missing. And that is really the challenge of applying artificial intelligence method to, to um, observational data because the traditional supervised machine learning model, supervised machine learning data is a model that train, given that you have a data set that you have labels and you have, <clears throat> 
the outcome. So you can train that model to predict the level on a new data set. But in the terms of counterfactual, you don't have that level. So it creates a new challenge for machine learning algorithms. And methods now have been developed to really overcome that challenge. But let us drive a little bit further into how a data set we counterfactually look like. So we never really observe what will happen to a patient under a different outcome. And this is really called the fundamental problem of causal inference. So we have our observational data for the, our given patient, John, Mary, and Peter were given some over or not. So we have observed covariates for those patients, yeah, 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 covariates, and then the treatment and the, out, and the outcome that was observed. So we are interested in looking at the true causal effect for each patient. Take for example, John, we have the co observed covariance for John. John was not treated with an OAP, or maybe if I'm looking at apixaban with the rosaban or warfarin, John wasn't given apixaban, but was given um, uh, rivarosaban. And we observed the out outcome for John. Yes, uh, John did have the outcome. So that's why not, because John was not treated with our um, uh, um, uh, treatment of interest. But we are interested in the true causal effect. So we have a missing data. The potential outcome of being treated is missing. What we only observe is the potential outcome of not being treated. So this is not really a direct supervised learning problem because our outcome here is a true effect is missing. So how do we go about you know, really solving this issue? Counterfactual prediction can never be truly validated as, as, we, as we know it because the true causal effect has never, is, is not observed. We can never really know this outcome. So no counterfactual model, if you be a machine learner, you can never truly validate this model. So in this context, it is really important that the counterfactual predictions are at least as plausible and persuasive as possible. And so that is why machine learning is really important here, because we have seen that this method can produce really good prediction, and we are trying to predict the counterfactual. So you want to use model that can produce that good enough prediction, but also account for the theoretical um, underlying data. So the challenges of causal inference, another aspect is a selection bias. In a selection bias, you know, you. I'll just give an example here. In, 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 in an observational data like in electronic medical records, a patient with aggressive cancer is more likely to receive an extensive treatment. Those patients will have aggressive tumors. They are more likely to receive aggressive treatment or extensive treatment. However, these patients also are more likely to experience the worst outcomes. So failure to account for this selection bias that you observe in the observation and may inaccurately lead to conclusion that extensive treatment is harmful to patients with aggressive tumor. So we need to be able to model the treatment or intervention distribution. And one thing that we also see is that this selection bias creates a covariate shift. That means your training data distribution is not the same as your testing data distribution. Again, your testing data is those patients that have not been, you've not observed any outcome or treatment for those patients. You are asking whether if I treat you, will you observe a favorable or um, uh, adverse outcome? So that those patients have not been treated, we don't know their outcome. So their distribution is different from those patients that your model was trained on. So that is what we call the covariate shift. And this is an important concept in some of the advanced machine learning technique that looks at transfer learning or domain adaptation. I think we are going to hear that during some, uh, <clears throat> one of the workshop presentation. So now we move into how do we estimate the individual treatment effect or sometimes also called the conditional um, uh, treatment effect in observational data we co-found it. So the observed factor outcome are given by the formula here, while the unobserved counterfactual is given by this formula here. We can just move there to calculate the average treatment effect and the average treatment effect is simply the average of the potential outcomes, the difference of the potential outcomes. However, doing that, you've not accounted for the, um, the, 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 the co-founders. A better approach is to actually model the two conditional um, outcome model, for example. 
let a tau one be the expected value of the potential outcome when treated given the covariates. Allow let tau zero be the, the, the expected value of the potential outcome when not treated given the um, covariate. Our goal is really to learn a function, the difference between the potential outcome condition on the, um, uh, the covariate, which is really the difference between these two estimates here. And in machine learning approach or any other, our goal, the goal is really to find uh, <clears throat> a loss function that estimate you know, the treatment, uh, the, that the difference between the treatment with small error, for example, the mean square error loss. But you cannot, you cannot really estimate the mean square error loss because you don't really know this estimate. There's no ground truth that gives you. So it's really a challenging problem. In the setting of <clears throat> observational data, the longitudinal data, we can extend that potential outcome framework to this um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, longitudinal or time series data. In this setting, we have patient data that are repeated over time. We have repeated observation for each patient. For example, John will have repeated medication, repeated uh, diagnosis, and so all the treatment. So for each patient, you have a treatment history, the um, uh, clinical factor history. And what you're interested in is, given a particular point in time, could you predict what are given the patient that medication or treatment will affect the outcome in the future. So now you have counterfactual trajectories. These are trajectories that are not actually observed, but potentially may, may occur. So how do you go about doing that? The biggest challenge with longitudinal data, as in most longitudinal studies, is that the treatment history can affect potential outcomes in the future. So it's not just the treatment at that particular time but your treatment history can actually affect or contribute to the um, counterfactual trajectory. So we need to model the treatment history as well as the longitudinal patient factors to be able to come out with a true counterfactual trajectory for each individual patient. So in a sense, the formula is the same thing. We apply the same potential outcome framework to, ex to estimate the potential outcome at a given point in time in the future by modeling the past treatment history and then condition that on the patient factors. So the same strategy can be used, but the care, we must be careful that we are modeling the treatment history because those are co-founding. The treatment history are co-founding on future treatments and outcomes. To be able to really like come out with see that the treatment effect is a causal relationship, that, that cause and effect, we must make some assumption. Without the assumption, this treatment effect is not identifiable. So there are some couple of example of uh, assumption that must be made. For example, the first one is a stable treatment value assumption or SUBVA, which states that the potential outcome for any patient do not vary with the treatment assignment to other patients. And for each patient, there are no different forms of version of each treatment level, which may lead to different potential outcome. The emphasis of this assumption is that there's no interference, there's no interaction, there's no spillover effect, and there's no hidden variation between treated and non-treated patients. That is one patient's uh, outcome will not affect another patient's outcome. Uh, put it in another way, for example, if a treatment has, a treatment medication may have different doses. But what if, we, if the case that one dose may lead to a different outcome, then no. Then one medication and a dose represent a treatment. Another, the, the same medication on another dose is another treatment. So the different levels of the medication are taken as different treatment. This is an important um, uh, assumption that sometimes it's not really, I mean, it's not, it, it can be violated in practice. For example, uh, with the pandemic, um, the fact that uh, somebody is not vaccinated may affect another person's outcome. So th sometimes this, this assumption may be violated, but we have to make the assumption to be able to come out with uh, um, a valid inference for the cause and effect or the treatment effect. It, the most important assumption is the conditional independence or what is called the ignorability or no or major confounders. 
It says that given the observed code variables, the treatment assignment W is independent of the potential outcome. So if I know all your um, um, clinical factors, then the treatment is independent of what potential outcome the patient may have. If two patients have the same value, their potential outcome should be the same, whatever the treatment assignment. That's really an important assumption to keep in mind. Or similarly, if two patients have the same X value, that treatment assignment should be the same, whatever their potential outcome. This assumption is valid so long as you can observe all the covariates, all the covariates. And that's where big data might be useful here. It will not hold if they are hidden confounders in the data set. So we always make this assumption to be able to come out with inference, but there are also techniques as we're going to see that can be used to actually retrieve hidden co-founders in the data set. Finally, the last assumption, which is a positivity or the overlap or common support. This assumption is really critical. Uh, it basically says that the process, the propensity score is bounded between zero and one. In the other sense, treatment assignment is not deterministic. Um, this this may, may say it may be put in another way. No subpopulation defined by X is entirely located in the treatment or entirely located in the control group. This implies a common support or overlap of the treatment and control groups. An example of this situation, suppose, for example, rich patient typically take a drug A, for example, and poor patient typically take a drug B, for example. Now, if we estimate the propensity score for drug A that is mostly taken by a rich patient on poor patient, then we are going to have a really poor estimate of that propensity score. So in a sense, we need to be able to model the distribution of the treatment effect and ensure that it is bounded away from zero and one. Without doing that, we have the main issue of the selection bias or what we call the distribution shift between the um, training and the um, uh, test set. The main challenge in causal inference from observational data, as you will see here multiple times, is the confounding variables and the, 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 <clears throat> the, the selection bias. And, and the, these two factors are really related so much that they are both called the strong ignorability condition. If you pick up any causal inference literature that assumes a potential outcome framework, you will always hear the strong ignorability condition because these are so related. And to be able to make inference and really come out with a true um, treatment effect, we have to make the make assumption. However, the validity of this strong ignorability condition cannot really be verified and by the data itself. You need domain knowledge. And this is this is this comes back to the um, motivation that I gave. Without domain expert in causality or domain expert that can give you the causal part, without the domain expert about the clinical usefulness of the, you cannot validate this strong ignorability condition. But I have a small different take on that. If the do, most often, if we have big data, big data can capture domain knowledge in the sense that. When clinicians, they go through, they say, okay, I have, I give this patient this medication based on what? And that information is recorded. We can still use that information. I've used that information for multiple different clinicians. We should be able to approximate or fairly approximate the strong inability condition. But it has to be mentioned that without that domain knowledge in the first place, we cannot validate this condition. Thus, how do we deal with co-founders? How do we do selection bias? Because we need to be able to train our machine learning algorithms. And that's where the different method methodologies have to come about. Some will be able to deal with one or both of them. So to estimate the individual treatment effect, we are not really interested in the coefficient of regressing X on Y, as we typically do in logistic regression or linear regression or we are not interested with the coefficient of the propensity score, not, or not all that, which we don't even know the relationship between the X and Y. We are not interested with those coefficients. 
what we are really interested in is good estimate of the, <clears throat> the mean of the potential outcome of treated given the X or the mean of the potential outcome, outcome not treated given the X is that's really what you need. You need tau one and tau zero. And this is why machine learning methods are really well suited because they, 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 you, you can train machine learning mo models to be able to predict this outcome fairly accurately, even though you will not be able to you know, um, uh, verify them well. So causal machine learning method for estimating um, uh, <clears throat> individual treatment effect can be categorized into three groups. You have the reweighting uh, or matching methods, and then you have meta learners. Meta learners are methods that estimate the individual treatment effect in a non-direct manner. And you can use any of the shell, any machine, any algorithm to be able to estimate the individual treatment effect. They also have the more um, uh, elaborate or modified <clears throat> machine learning methods. This method, you actually modify the underlying theory of the machine learning algorithm to be able to estimate the individual treatment effect. So we are going to take each one of these um, uh, methods but more focused on the meta learners and the modified machine learning model. But to be able to understand, we have to talk about reweighting and matching methods. So sample reweighting methods, popular propensity score. Uh, and in the literature or most, in most of our research, propensity score is commonly used to estimate the average treatment effect. And how does it work? You, it simply, you, 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 you sample, you reweight your, your <clears throat> It's a sample reweighting is common strategy to elevate you know, selection bias. The key idea here is that by assigning appropriate weight to each sample in your observation, a pseudo population can be created where the distribution of the treated and control groups are similar. So basically you're trying to um, uh, mitigate that um, uh, domain shift or covariance shift in your um, uh, data. So the inverse propensity score is, you estimate the propensity score and then you try to assign each patient in the population with this weight that is based on the propensity score. And then using that, you cannot estimate the inverse propensity score average treatment effect or the IPW, which is given by this formula here. Uh, traditionally, you know, this is a very popular technique, but there are problems with the inverse propensity score weighting. The main problem is that it depends strongly on the correctness of the propensity score. Also, the reweighting strategy can introduce high variance. So therefore, you need methods that are able to produce you good estimate of the propensity score. And again, this is where machine learning models are favorable because they can estimate good um, uh, the, the, the propensity score or the treatment distribution fairly accurately. And there's a lot of work that has been done in terms of estimating the inverse propensity score. And we did apply in one of the CSE projects where we use the generalized boosting um, uh, algorithm to be able to estimate the propensity score for weighting purposes. Now, another level is what we call the double robust estimator or DR. This simply augments the propensity score by weighting estimate or with the outcome model. The outcome model is simply the probability of the outcome given the treatment and the covariates. So that's the outcome model. So you take the, the propensity score, the inverse propensity score estimator, and then you augment it with the uh, outcome model, as you see here. So this is our standard propensity score, and we augment it with this factor here and this other factor here. This gives us an unbiased estimate of the treatment effect or the average treatment effect. Unbiased in the sense that if the propensity score is not accurate or misspecified, but the outcome model is correct, then the, uh, the average treatment effect is unbiased. So if the outcome model is misspecified but the propensity score is correctly estimated, we still have an unbiased estimate. So that's why it's called the double robust estimator. has been used widely uh, to be able to estimate you know, average treatment effect in observational data. One other very interesting technique is the targeted maximum likelihood. Again, the targeted maximum likelihood is a double robust, as a double robust maximum likelihood based approach for estimating the average treatment effect in observational data with an additional nice property that is that it reduces the variance. So <clears throat> TMLE estimate both the outcome and the propensity score model just like in the double robust, 
but then it incorporates a secondary targeting step that optimizes the bias variance trade up. You know, you heard about the bias variance trade up of most machine learning. So try to optimize that trade up between the bias and the variance for the parameter of interest. And in this case, the parameter of interest could be your potential outcome or the treatment effect. A major advantage of the targeted maximum model is that it is it, it, it can flexibly incorporate a variety of machine learning algorithms. And more specifically, we can easily train and combine several machine learning algorithms like in an ensemble using the super learner algorithm to generate fairly accurate and consistent estimate of the outcome and, propensity, and the propensity score model. And I'm lucky to say that the super learner algorithm was actually developed by one of my colleague here and the speaker, um, Dr. Eric Pauli. And he, I think he will be giving some more um, uh, insight on the super learner algorithm later. So we've heard about the um, uh, reweighting strategy. I talk about the targeted maximum likelihood, but another way to also estimate the average treatment effect or individual treatment effect is by matching methods. Matching methods really try to estimate the counterfactual for each patient by simply using the patient, the closest patient from the other treatment group. So if I have a treated patient, I try to match uh, um, uh, with a similar patient from the untreated group. That gives me you know, the potential outcome. And the matching is based on what? Some similarity measure. You can use the propensity score as a similarity measure, but you can also use distance-based metrics for matching. Popular ones are Euclidean distance, Mahranobis distance, and also a novel one, random forest proximity distance that we're going to see next. Then you use a matching algorithm, for example, nearest neighbor, caliper, kernels, and there are many other matching algorithm you can use to match similar observation based on the similarity measure. I focus more on the random forest because first random forest, which I'm going to describe a little more, more is very flexible in modern high dimensional data set, can handle missing values in a natural way. And then the method can handle both, you know, continuous and categorical outcomes in a natural way. So, it's, I think the technique is more suitable to, to, to actually compute um, a proximate um, a similarity. So about the random forest proximity matching, we know that the Euclidean and Mahomedes distance are well-defined only for continuous variables. They cannot handle missing data and uh, expensive to compute for high dimensional data. So these challenges are well handled by the random forest. More, more, more importantly, random forest excel in prediction and provide a unified way of finding similarity between observation with mixture of continuous and categorical variables. So that's, that's why is, is random forest provide us with a, a really nice way to estimate similarity between observation. Now, how do we measure similarity between observation? What you do is that you can train the random forest model to predict the propensity score, the probability of the treatment given the covariance. Now the random forest proximity <clears throat> score model output what is called the proximity matrix. This proximity de matrix defines how the treatment and control observations are similar. And how is that so? Two patients or two observations are similar if these two patients, they fall in the same terminal group. So you build a random forest, you build multiple trees and you combine them. And then you have two patients and you drop them on the random tree. You follow the path and then finally fall in the same terminal leaf. That means you've gone through all the various branches and splits and they finally fall in the same terminal mode. Those two patients must be similar on majority of their covariance, which can be categorical or continuous. So that is really a very strong way of finding the similarity between two patients basically creating some form of an artificial experiment. So that proximity matrix now for all patients that can now be used for a matching algorithm because I compare, if those two patients are falling in the same leaf, but one of them had the treatment, one of them did not have the treatment, then I, that basically gives me my, uh, my potential outcome to be able to estimate my treatment effect. Or you can apply it again to another sub, um, uh, downstream algorithm to estimate a much more robust treatment effect, which is exactly what we did in our CSC project. Now let's talk about the meta-learners. Uh, 
The simplest approach to estimate the individual treatment effect is to train two classifiers, one to estimate tau one, which we saw the definition, and tau zero separately, and then you compute the difference. That's the most simplest way you apply robust machine learning algorithm to do that. So these methods of training two different models to estimate these two separate parameters, they are called T-learners. The disadvantage of this method is that you're modeling the treatment distribution separately. So if you train a model on the treated patients or control patients, you're not taking the interaction between these two, these two distribution. And so you might be modeling the treatment, but not the, 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 the treatment effect. So another simple alternative is to train a single model, a single model for the outcome. That is just say train a single model on your training set, and then you predict the, uh, <clears throat> the outcome for the, both the treatment and the control patient, and you take the difference. Those methods are called the single learners. And in this approach now, you can actually try to model the selection bias issue. Co-founding, of course, you, you will not be able to model hidden co-founders, but you should be able to model the selection bias issue. Other meta learners include the X, the double robust, the arrow learners. These methods use some form of a transform outcome. The transform outcome, you can be taking like, you take your treatment, you take the outcome, and you try to combine them together to create a single outcome in your training set. Then you build a standard supervised learning algorithm to predict that transform outcome. And that transform outcome is actually an um, 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 an estimator of the treatment effect. So there are other um, uh, um, algorithms for, for the meta learners that can be seen in this um, uh, <clears throat> reference that we have here. Now let's look into the modified or adapted um, uh, um, uh, algorithms. And the most machine learning modified methods are based on trees. And because trees really provide an um, intuitive and interpretable way to, to, to model causal relationship or complex relationship in your data. Take for example, you have on the figure, you see that we have patients who benefit or patients that will not benefit or those that will have equiv equivocal benefit. We can apply a tree algorithm to kind of separate those patients or finally come out with four different groups, those that will benefit, those that will be harmed or those that will have equivocal um, uh, <clears throat> benefit. And the way tree, really, tree algorithm really works is that you're going through all your variables and you're looking for a variable that if you split on, it will provide the most information about your classification problem. For example, the second figure here shows that we have our data set and there's a variable called patrons and there's a variable called type. If I split on patron, it will go to, you have known, sum, and four. But if I split on type, I almost have a mixture of my classification. So that means patron splitting on patron provides me with more information about my classification compared to splitting on type. So I'll favor splitting on patron. And that's really how my classification my, my <clears throat> decision tree works. So we can apply this now to estimate the um, treatment effect. And the method that has really been that was developed to really use um, a classification and regression tree or CAR to identify subgroup effect was the causal trees. So you modify the algorithm and split only on variables that will lead to differences in the outcome based on the treatments. So in the causal tree, you partition the training data into nodes such that it maximizes the treatment heterogeneity between the nodes while minimizing it within the nodes. Thus, each terminal node, which we can also call cluster of the causal tree, represent a custom-made artificial ML experiment in which patients are similar as possible and where the treatment effect uh, <clears throat> for that specific cluster can be used to predict um, uh, individual treatment effect for future patients. So what this is really saying is that after splitting on variables that minimizes the treatment effect within each cluster or heterogeneity and maximizing between cluster, you're kind of creating a kind of a, 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 a randomized control experiment within each node, where in that node, all patients are similar 
So you can basically estimate the potential outcome for each patient. So another important property of the causal tree is that it estimates what is called the honest, honest estimation. This is a criteria where you build your tree separately and then you build, and then the, the process of building the tree uses a different data and the process of estimating your treatment effect uses a different data. So what I simply do is that I build my tree using the same technique of maximizing heterogeneity between nodes and within nodes, minimize within node. But when I find my when I finally estimate the tree, I do not use that tree to estimate my treatment effect within the nodes. I use a different data. I take my tree, I predict on a different data, then I go into the leaf node. That's where I estimate my treatment effect. So we basically use this idea to create a combined causal tree and the targeted maximum likelihood because the targeted maximum likelihood is double robust. We wanted a robust confidence interval. So we use that approach in our CSE project as I'm going to describe next, later. What about causal forest? You just, just simply move from causal tree to causal forest as we've seen about the random forest. As we know, random forest is a really versatile algorithm. It excels in prediction. It uses um, uh, multiple splits to um, uh, multiple trees to generate the final prediction. The one thing about the single tree is that it can be very noisy and prone to overfitting. A single decision tree is very, very prone to overfitting and noisy. But if you build multiple trees using the idea of a random forest, then you can actually um, uh, <clears throat> reduce the variance or the noise that those single tree create. So that's really the idea. What, what, what if we build multiple causal trees and then combine the prediction of the treatment effect within each tree and come up with the overall treatment effect for each individual? Now, this is this creates a much more accurate estimate of the causal tree of, of the treatment effect. But one thing that it misses is that between in the, in the idea of interpretability, we lose the interpretability of the causal tree. So in our CSE project, we really wanted to find out what are some of the factors that are contributing to treatment heterogeneity. So we couldn't really use the causal forest because we want, wanted to find those subgroups that are different. And because we want to find subgroups that are different, using the standard causal tree will not give us very um, valid confidence interval. So that's why we um, combine the causal trees with the targeted maximum likelihood so that we can get um, a validated confidence interval to say that this group is different from this group by how much? And is, it, is that difference significant? Another clever technique, which I want to just simply highlight as one of the advanced um, method for estimating um, <coughs> treatment effect is the GANI. The idea here is to use the generative adversarial networks to, to generate artificial counterfactuals. So we know for each patient, you can only have one um, uh, potential outcome. The others is not observed, but what if we could generate fake counterfactuals? And that's where this smart tech um, um, uh, method comes in. We can actually estimate, we can actually generate from the distribution that we have, those counterfactual. The intuition here is that if we can generate artificial or fake counterfactual, if they follow the distribution of the training data, then it will be difficult for us, even humans, to distinguish the real or the factual observation from the counterfactual. And that we can use that now to estimate our individual treatment effect. Now, a little background about the generative adversarial network. These are models that generate fake examples. So in the generative adversarial network, in the network that you see in the graph below here is that we have a generator that generate fake example. And then we have a discriminator that tries to identify where the observation is coming from, whether it is real or it's fake. And I will say here that there's no limit to say how successful this algorithm has been. I mean, it has been so successful that Success is, I, I, I can't quantify it because it can generate, for example, images, fake images about you know, the world that you will not be able to even tell whether this is fake or real. Another great application is that, for example, if you, if you have uh, an, an image that is not, I mean, 
you have an image that is infected with noise, you can basically use the generative adversarial network to generate the real image, the original image, because that image is noisy, but it comes from a distribution. So you are trying to generate a new image that comes from the true distribution. So what I'm trying to get here is that there's that issue of causal relationship in the generative process. So generative models are not limited to deep learning. These are models that have been used over the years, even in traditional sciences, the gyp sampling uh, methods, even random forest can generate data. But the cleverness of the generative as a network is that it puts the problem into a supervised learning nature where you generate the data in one block. And then in another block now, we try to now predict whether this is true or false. In that sense, we are training the generator to generate real examples. So now this method, Garnite, uses that idea to generate fake counterfactors. Once we have the fake counterfactors that actually are shown to follow the true generation, true data generation process, then we can use that now to estimate treatment effect. There's more to this. Uh, <clears throat> to this, and I'll invite you to check this YouTube link here, and you will explain the method for much better than I than I can. But uh, I've started using the method in Mayo Clinic to look at how we can um, uh, estimate the treatment effect of a uh, um, uh, remote care program, as I'll describe next. So, on the application wise. <clears throat> I think I have a couple of minutes to finish up here. So I'll just go through the applications. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to go through application using the sensitive pressure. So the first one is mining heterogeneity of oral anticoagulants in arterial fibrillation. We use a causal tree and targeted maximum likelihood. And then the second application, which I'm not going to describe here, but I'm just going to call it out because it's still an ongoing project is to identify patients at risk of acute healthcare utilization or death that can be avoided if we enroll the patient into a remote care program. <clears throat> at Mayo Clinic, we have several remote care um, um, programs and the advent, the pandemic has shown the value of remote care. So we want to be able to identify patients that, can, that will benefit from a remote care management program or multiple programs, or if that patient will not benefit at all, so we will not enroll the patient in the program. So I'm using the same model that we applied in the assessing project, the causal tree and targeted maximum likelihood, also using causal forest and the garnite. So I have this um, uh, workflow of the CESI project. So we have about 34,000 um, uh, new users of oral anticoagulant. These are every patients between 2010 and 2017. So what we do is that first on the top, we apply the causal forest proximity matching that I described, but we have four treatments. We have apixaban, debigatron, rivaloxaban, and warfarin. So we look at head-to-head -head matching. We look at head-to-head -head matching. So I have match apixaban versus debigatron, apixaban versus warfarin. So all together, we have six different um, pairs to match. So we, we match the data set. And then in the next step is I split the data set into two because I need to train the model and come up with my optimal clustering model. So I have my training data that trains the clustering model and it, <clears throat> the targeted maximum likelihood. So basically I apply the, <clears throat> I use the training set, the 80% cluster generation data to train my propensity score model and to train my outcome model. This will be used for my targeted maximum likelihood. Then I also train my causal tree forest model. That gives me a tree. Then I go into that tree now using the same idea of the honest explanation. At each node of the tree, I train a targeted maximum likelihood um, uh, model. To do that, to make sure that I have a strong, um, a fairly robust estimate, I set in you know, specific limits for the number of observations that should be within a node the number of cases, outcome cases, and the number of treatment. So I set all those parameters to ensure that I have a robust estimate of the, the targeted maximum likelihood estimate. So at the end, I have my clusters, which are the leaf nodes, with estimate from targeted maximum likelihood, 
with their confidence interval. So with the confidence interval, I can fairly tell whether this group is different from another group. But then that does not give me the overall best causal tree model because each time you train a causal tree model, it may give you different clustering. So I use the 20% cluster validation data using the estimated cluster or leaves. I build a subsequent model, can build logistic regression or random forest using, using the cluster membership and to predict one of the outcomes that I'm interested. So I predict now and I use what we call the, the technique of decision curve analysis of net benefit to predict the, 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 the outcome. Then I compute the area under the net benefit. You can think of it like the area under the rock curve. That same um, analysis will work here. So the best causal tree model is a model with the best um, area under the net benefit curve. So I select that model now, and that model now will now be used to predict for future observation. So I have my causal tree, which is interpretable. I have confidence interval for each node that I can apply to new observation. So I'm just going to show you the result for the <clears throat> factors that are contributing to treatment heterogeneity of the bigger trans versus river rosa band on <clears throat> a, a composite of acechemic stroke, intracranial bleeding, and all cause mortality. So this is a composite outcome, but we also look at the outcome individually. So this is a causal tree model. The first thing that you notice is that it's interpretable. It can easily be implemented into practice and you can see whether it conforms to domain knowledge. So that's the, that's the reason why we decided to use the causal tree and target the maximum. I picked this example specifically because I find something that is very interesting. There are multiple of these trees for the different head to head comparison. What I define here is that we, 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 we start on a node, we split on EGFR, so these are patients with good kidney function per se. They are less than 90 degree. It's 90 percent. Um, they is split on has blood, uh, high has blood score, for example, and they is split on age, age greater than 64. But the interesting thing here is that if further split on that same age, all patients that are greater than 64 years old and less than 67 years old will benefit from the bigger trial. But all patients that are greater than 64 years old and 67 years old, they'll benefit from rivarosabine. The reason I picked this example is to contrast with the regular subgroup analysis. Regular subgroup analysis, you start, you pre-specify your cutoff point, for example, all patients that will benefit from that are greater than 65 years old, and then you look at the subgroup analysis. By doing that, you miss out all this heterogeneity that we've identified here to be able to come out with an automatic cutoff point, which is 67 here. So this is, a, this is, this is really what, when it comes to like, how do we identify subgroup with differential effect to the treatment of the bigatran versus rivarosaban for mortality, bleeding, or the composite outcome that we devise. And with that, we have some references of the third, uh, studies uh, that are used to this, and also references in the, um, uh, in the agenda that are provided. And with that, thank you. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Nifu. That was a fantastic presentation. It's, it's really amazing. Just, uh, um, however, we are behind the schedule. So <clears throat> because of that, maybe we'll first uh, move to Dr. Kohli's presentation and we'll have the Q&A afterwards together. Is that okay? Thank you, um, everyone. So our second speaker today is Dr. Eric Kohli. He's an associate professor in the Department of Public Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago, where he's the faculty director for data science in public health concentration in the Masters of Public Health program. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Dr. Poli was previously an assistant professor of biostatistics <clears throat> in the Department of Quantitative Health Sciences and Mayo Clinic. He received his PhD in biostatistics from UC Berkeley in 2010 with Mark Vanderland, they developed the superlearner ensemble prediction methodology. <clears throat> Prior to joining Mile, 
Dr. Poli was a mathematical statistician in the biometric research branch and US NCI. His research areas involves the development and evaluation of prediction models, innovative methods for diagnostics and prognostic prediction, and precision medicine clinical trial design. Today, he will present on using causal inference to support clinical decision making. Dr. Poli, please take it away from here. Thank you. Great, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk today. Uh, so what I'll be taking uh, is sort of building off of what Che has presented previously and a little bit more detail about how we do the, uh, the causal model. Um, so with that, here's my outline for today uh, where I'll talk a little bit about, uh, let me make that go away, uh, where I'll talk a little bit about confounding and sort of review some of those assumptions just briefly, just so we're all on the, the same page talk a bit about you know, specific examples of how machine learning can be used in the causal inference setting. Uh, I'm gonna spend a lot of time today talking about interpretability and how that's going to work in the causal setting and how we can use that to help evaluate uh, the estimates that we are getting uh, from these models. And then finally, a, a brief uh, detour into how to assess clinical utility. Uh, so with that, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, reviewing the notation. Uh, it'll be similar to what we just saw with Che, where my outcome of interest is going to be Y. I differ from Che in that I like to use A for my treatment because I think of treatment as some action, and that's A. Um, and that's the one thing we're going to disagree on in our notation between these two slides, that I'll use A for my treatment indicator or my action indicator for the, the treatment effects we're interested in. Um, X, as before, will be that vector of baseline covariates, and I'll, we'll define the counterfactuals, as we just saw in the, in the previous presentation, as using superscripts to be the, and all the associated assumptions that go along with those. Now, I, I just want to spend a minute, because I think this is really important, to think about the hierarchy of effect estimates. Um, often when we're talking about randomized clinical trials or you know, the, the average, the sort of a treatment effect in a patient population, we'll often start at that highest level, that average treatment effect. But this assumes, you know, that we're going to have a common treatment effect um, across the entire population. And what we might be interested in is we think there's going to be, or if we expect there's going to be some heterogeneity of that treatment effect, something like the conditional average treatment effect, where I can look within a set of covariates that I'll denote here W, what is that treatment effect within that subgroup where W is going to be some subset of my uh, baseline covariates that I've measured. And that's sort of you know, in between where I'm, I'm sort of grouping down into a smaller group and looking at the treatment effects within that subgroup. But the most extreme that I can go down to is this individual treatment effect that for that given individual, the ith individual, what is the treatment effect on that uh, counterfactual or potential outcome scale? And so what this slide really highlights is we have that sort of highest level down to the individual level. And usually where we're going uh, when we're getting into clinical treatment decision support is that middle ground where there may be some subgroup of patients where the treatment effect is going to flip, where I may recommend one treatment over the other. And if I could find those, that will help me decide when to give one treatment versus the other is that middle ground, sort of the ideal setting where we will have some information to be able to evaluate that, um, but it's not assuming the same a treatment effect for everyone within my population. And so with that, just as Che has mentioned, um, because we're going to be estimating these from observational studies, there is that potential for confounding. And I'll use the same notation for propensity scores throughout my slides. That E of X is going to be that probability of receiving uh, one of the treatments conditional on those baseline covariates. And in almost all of our settings, this is going to be unknown. And we can, we'll be looking at methods of estimating the propensity score with some of these machine learning algorithms and how some of the different approaches we might want to use when we're in the context of causal inference. And then um, with that, I also wanted to review 
um, these different machine learning approaches to estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. Because I think these are really important. And uh, although Che had, had introduced some of these, I, I thought I'd spend a few minutes reviewing some of the pros and cons of these different approaches. So the first one that Che introduced where you, you basically set off with doing an outcome model, where I'm interested in a regression model of the expectation of why given my treatment and my baseline covariates. And we use the common notation here as an, an M for that outcome model. And there's a few different, you know, if you're familiar with the causal inference literature, this is often what's referred to as the G computation method. Um, but Che had mentioned a few different ways you could do this. One, you could be completely non-parametric in the treatment effect, where you could say, given everyone who received intervention zero, I build a mo an outcome model, and everyone who received um, treatment one, build an outcome model, and then I do the imputation of everyone in my data set from those two models, and I can apply the G computational formula in that setting. Now that is nice because we're not making any assumptions about interactions between the treatment and the baseline covariates, but where it can fall apart is if I have this sort of confounding by indication where the model that's trained on a subset of patients who are treated may not generalize well to those who are untreated, and I haven't captured that within the modeling process, I'm going to have a bias estimate for my treatment effect in, in that scenario. Now, the alternative um, is to incorporate both the treatment and the baseline covariates into the same machine learning algorithm. And there, what I have to do to get that heterogeneous treatment effect correct is correctly model all of the interactions between the treatment and the covariates, and then apply that G computation algorithm uh, to get those estimates of the, the um, treatment effects that I'm interested in. And so it relies very heavily are completely on that assumption of getting the model of those interactions correct to be for it for that to work. And so that that requires a lot of assumptions that we may not be comfortable with depending on the clinical settings. In some settings, we have a good understanding of how to do the outcome model, but if we don't feel confident about that, this may not be the best approach to use. So an alternative that was mentioned is a transformation of the outcome. Um, and this was something that Mark Vander and I wrote a paper about back in 2009, that if we do this, if we estimate the propensity score and then do a uh, project the outcome into the, the original outcome Y by my treatment indicator A divided by the propensity score. So everyone who received treatment one will be their outcome divided by their probability of receiving that outcome. And everyone who was on the treatment zero or the control group would be their observed outcome divided by one minus the predicted propensity score. And what's neat about this transformation is that when I then do a regression model of this transformed outcome Z on my baseline covariates X, or in this case W, it's a trick where the loss function of that regression model is now solving the estimating equation that we usually are referring to when we talk about inverse probability of treatment weight. And so it's, it's a neat trick that makes the loss function of my regression model solve the usual estimating equation that we think of when we talk about uh, the context of inverse probability weighting. And so while this gets more directly at that causal estimate and is accounting for some of the confounding by indication or the, the confounding that we can adjust for with the propensity score, in practice, what uh, my experience with this is it tends to be underpowered compared to some of the other methods. You know, if the propensity scores are adding increased variance, um, and then by not sort of directly going towards my target parameter of the causal effect estimate, I may not be as powerful as some of the other methods. So although it's a neat trick, um, there may be other methods that are more efficient available, depending on the scenario. And so finally, the, the targeted minimum loss-based estimation or the TMLE, uh, what I like about this is it's, you know, you, you, the, the downside is you have to estimate both the propensity score model and the outcome model. But what's really nice about the TMLE approach 
is that it forces you to think specifically about what is my targeted parameter of interest and how do I build an estimator that is specific to that? You know, so if I think about you know, this top one, this estimating this full outcome regression model, that's trying to build a model that works for everyone and to get all of the, the parameters of both my you know, treatment effect estimators, but also all those baseline covariates, all of those parameters need to be, need to be optimized in that regression model. But what I'm really interested in is only a subset of those. Or if I'm estimating here this propensity score, that's just a nuisance parameter. I'm not actually interested in making inference about the propensity score, but I need to account for it to get at the thing that I'm interested in. And the neat trick with the targeted minimum loss-based estimation or the targeted maximum likelihood estimation is that it forces you to think about what is the thing that I'm really interested in estimating. And I can start with these complicated models uh, where the bias variance trade-off is for that large par parametric space, but then do that update step that is incorporated into that method to focus down on the parameter that I'm specifically interested in to be more efficient for that um, uh, treatment effect estimate that I'm interested in instead of being globally um, trading off the bias and variance. And so, you know, these are different approaches. And when I talk about some of the machine learning approaches on the next few slides, they'll apply to all of these. Um, but I thought it was important to sort of weigh some of the pros and cons of these different approaches as you're thinking about your own application. And so one other thing I wanted to note, we often talk about in the machine learning literature that we have a loss function that I'm then trying to optimize um, the, the, the loss between my predicted outcome and my observed outcome. But when my goal is causal inference, we may want to, you know, we may not want to use something like, you know, the model with the, the uh, best mean squared error may not be the best model for my treatment decision rule down the road. Um, you know, I have an example here, you know, if I'm interested in the, the conditional average treatment effect, that my intention is to use it for make treatment decisions, uh, where what I'm really interested in is not so much the magnitude of the, the treatment difference, but the sign. You know, if it's positive, then recommend treatment one. If it's negative, recommend treatment zero. But in that context, I might tolerate a little bit additional bias on the effect estimate. You know, whether it's positive 1.1 or positive 1.5, it's still the same decision at the end of the day. And so in some scenarios, we may allow a little bit more um, um, sort of bias in the effect estimate, as long as it's not flipping the sign. And so there are scenarios where the best model, machine learning model for getting my causal effect estimate is not the one with the best mean squared error. It's one that performs better on the actual target that I'm interested in, building a rule for treatment decisions. And similar, another example that I've encountered when we're working with a large set of treatments, you know, I may have be working in a scenario where I have 10 different treatments or actions that the patients may be able to sort of pick between. And I have to make a decision, which one uh, do I want to assign to a given patient um, given their baseline covariates or given their history? Uh, if I'm trying to say, build an algorithm that predicts the best treatment among this large class of treatments, that may be too hard of a problem. I may not have enough data to do that. Um, but if I'm just saying I wanna be close to the best, if I allow a little bit of variability around that, because there may be two or three treatments that are all performing really well, um, but I'm performing similar, and it's gonna be hard to differentiate what is best on them. But if I, if I make a regret or a loss function that says, as long as I'm close to the optimum or close to the best, I'm going to allow it, that gives me a little bit more flexibility in building my machine learning models um, that may sort of benefit myself in the end instead of trying to push too hard to be, you know, making sure that I'm getting the best treatment um, close, maybe be, may be close enough. Uh, so it's important to think about when you're working in this context that the machine learning algorithms are going to have one loss function, but your goal at the end of the day with the causal inference may be a very different loss function. And we need to think about how to integrate these two as we're working on our applications. Uh, so with that, um, 
I want to talk a little bit about some of the strategies for doing uh, machine learning algorithms within the context of trying to estimate causal effects. So the one thing we need to discuss is that uh, all of these machine learning algorithms, whether I'm doing a propensity score model or the outcome model, um, are going to have hyperparameters that we need to select. You know, think of these, you know, in a random forest, you know, what is the number of variables to check at each node? Or if I'm doing a gradient boosting algorithm, how many trees do I want to estimate? If I'm doing a lasso, you know, what value of lambda on the regression penalty do I want to use? So all of these algorithms are going to have hyperparameters that we need to make decisions on. And there's a two different approaches that I wanted to highlight here. One is that we can incorporate into my training an internal cross-validation, where I could say, you know, on my given training data set that I'm estimating this machine learning model on, do an internal either bootstrap or cross-validation process to search over a grid of hyperparameter values. And so that's, you know, splitting up my data and trying to do a data-driven selection of the hyperparameters. An alternative, that I use more often is instead of trying to, you know, do an internal cross-validation search for those hyperparameters, is we consider unique values of the hyperparameters as distinct algorithms and build a stacked ensemble library. And so Che mentioned previously this idea of a super learner, where the idea of a super learner is I can try a whole bunch of different algorithms for my given task, say estimating the propensity score. And when I talk about different algorithms, they don't necessarily need to be, you know, uh, lasso regression versus uh, random forest. It may be different random forest implementations with different values of those uh, hyperparameters are, can be distinct algorithms within that stacked ensemble and let the stacked ensemble process decide how to weight each one of those uh, individual algorithms uh, for my final decision. You know, again, you know, these hyperparameters are nuisance parameters. I'm not interested in saying that, you know, the lasso regression with lambda equal to 0.1 is the best algorithm. What I'm just trying to get at is my causal effect at the end of the day. And so, you know, instead of trying to do, you know, additional cross-validation, which may take additional compute time, I can just incorporate that into a stacked ensemble and move forward uh, to the, the parameters that I'm actually interested in. And one thing I wanted to highlight here too is that, you know, if we're going to use this idea of an internal cross-validation to search over a grid of hyperparameter values, back to that idea that the loss function we're usually thinking about machine learning isn't necessarily the loss function we're interested in for the causal effect estimation. Um, an interesting idea I've, I've used and I've seen work really well um, is that the, uh, the example here is you could build a gradient boosted algorithm for the propensity score. And the usual process for a gradient boosted algorithm, one of the tuning parameters is how many trees. Because you know, as you keep adding trees to your forest, eventually it's going to start to overfit and get worse. But if for the propensity score model that I'm trying to estimate, I'm not necessarily concerned about minimizing overfit. I want to optimize the propensity scores so that my baseline covariates are balanced for doing my average treatment effect estimation down the road. And so what McCaffrey has implemented in some of their packages is that instead of trying to do the cross-validation search over the, the hyperparameter, the number of trees in their gradient boosting algorithm for the one that minimizes the mean squared error, the minimum log likelihood, they optimize for um, minimizing difference between weighted uh, baseline covariates between their treatment groups. And so what this is doing is, is this is now thinking instead of the usual machine learning algorithm to estimate the hyperparameters, think about the context you're trying to do and what's going to work best for the propensity score model is something that's going to balance my treatment groups. And so let's pick our hyperparameters towards that goal. And, and that's what they've proposed here. And I think this is a nice example of not just using off the shelf machine learning, but thinking about uh, how to optimize for your task at hand. 
And then one thing that we need to note here is, you know, we talked about many different types of um, methods to use machine learning to estimate the, the causal effect estimate. And if you look into the, the theoretical results of these, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, the, what Doster classes is and the, um, you know, what that means. But the basic idea is that if we want to have valid inference, and inference here being you know, that the standard errors of my average treatment effect or conditional average treatment effect are valid, the machine learning estimates cannot, for those nuisance functions, cannot be too flexible. We need to have a, a specific rate of convergence of those machine learning algorithms. Otherwise, the inference is not going to be valid. And I may have uh, invalid inference because I was too flexible in how I am too flexible in the machine learning algorithms that I use to estimate the propensity scores in the outcome model. And a good example of this is something like random forest doesn't fit within this class. And so if I'm using random forest to estimate my propensity scores, I'm not necessarily going to have valid estimates from that targeted uh, minimum loss based estimation. But there's a solution. And there are two sort of proposals out there in the literature right now on how to relax this assumption to allow us to be able to use machine learning methods specifically so that I'm still getting valid inference on the causal effect estimates that I'm interested in. So the first um, solution is fairly straightforward. We could just restrict to classes of machine learning methods that are flexible, but still meet these assumptions in terms of rates of convergence. Um, and a good example of that um, is some work by Ben Kessler and Vanderland on what's known as the highly adaptive lasso. So this is still a flexible algorithm, but it's within the class of algorithms that will still have valid inference um, for the, the average treatment effect. So, um, you know, that's one approach is to just you know, remain within that class. And they do say you, know, you can still do a super learner type algorithm. It's just the um, the method, the algorithms in that stacked ensemble are all within this class of algorithms that fit within this, you know, for example, the highly adaptive lasso. So that's one approach. The other approach that I, I, I've used more commonly is instead of restricting to those algorithms, what we can do is we can design a sample splitting process to break apart the estimation of the nuisance parameter, the propensity score and the outcome model, and the estimation of the causal effect. And so as, lo as long as I'm splitting the sample where I'm estimating those nuisance parameter machine learning models in one set, and then estimating the causal effect in another subset of my data, that allows me to be more flexible and still have valid inference. And this idea of data adaptive estimation of causal effects goes all the way back to Bickle in 1982, but we've seen a resurgence in this literature, and it goes by many different names, but it's all basically the same idea um, of splitting your data, being very flexible in the machine learning uh, algorithms that we can use, but still having valid inference uh, for the causal effect estimates. And so, uh, you know, there is the cross-validated target of maximum likelihood uh, proposed um, by Zhang and Vanderland. Um, and so it, it's a version of the TML algorithm that does sample splitting for estimating the nuisance parameters and updating the targeted parameter and allows you to be more flexible in estimating those. Uh, more recently in the machine learning literature, the double maximum, double machine learning or robust machine learning, um, same idea. And then also you know, around the same time, there's this idea of cross-fitting. And the, the, the cross-fitting literature has a really, there's a, a paper by Zivich and Breskin that I think really visually shows what's going on when we talk about sample splitting with the intent of estimating the causal average treatment effect. And so I, I, I thought I would show this, and, but you know, all the different methods that I just mentioned, it's all basically the same idea, but this is a really nice visualization of that. So you can imagine starting with your full data set where you know, my rows here are the different observations in my data set. Z would be my baseline covariates, X is your treatment indicator, and Y is your outcome of interest. What they are doing here is a double robust estimator where I need to estimate both the propensity score and my outcome model. 
And so because they're doing two different nuisance parameter estimates to be able to estimate the average treatment effect at the end of the day, they need to split their data into three parts. And so that's what they've done here. And you can imagine, you know, similar to like threefold cross-validation, you split your data into three parts. And so on the first part, on the top part here, I estimate a propensity score model, pi sub one or E sub one, and I estimate an outcome model one. And then what I do from those two models that I've just trained on that first part of my data is I apply the propensity score model to the second partition of my data. And then I apply the outcome model to the third partition of my data. And now I cycle through so that on each partition of my data set, it's using a different partition to estimate the propensity score and a different partition to estimate the outcome model. And then I can stack these all back together and estimate my average treatment effect just as Chait spoke earlier. But by doing this data splitting, I now have valid inference for that average treatment effect or the conditional average treatment effect, if that's what I was interested in, by doing this data splitting. And so I could use you know, very data adaptive machine learning algorithms um, in this way and still have valid inference. And so I think this is a really nice visualization of how to think about organizing your data um, if you do want to have very flexible estimation and valid inference at the end of the day. And so with that, um, I wanna talk a little bit about interpretability. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of attention given to interpretability of machine learning models and you know, we can think about this, you know, I've, I've built a model like here being the outcome model, that's some very flexible machine learning algorithm, and, you know, it's giving my inputs, my treatment and my uh, baseline covariates. And we want to understand what M is using as inputs to be able to predict that outcome. Um, or, you know, it, you know, it may be more flexible, you know, I've estimated an average treatment effect, I want to understand how this machine learning machinery is estimating that treatment effect. What is it using? What information is it using? And when you get into the interpretability literature, there's kind of two different subtypes of interpretability that I think are really important to break out um, within this context. So there's this idea of global interpretability. And think of this as like this holistic view, sort of a high level, what is the algorithm using uh, to be able to predict on the outcome? You know, is, you know, age be important for this model? Not necessarily, you know, how it's important, but sort of at a grand level, global level, you know, what information is the model using to be able to predict the outcome? And then there's a contrast to this, which is referred to as local inter interpretability. And this is really getting at sort of a single patient or a cluster of patients that are all sort of close to each other in that high dimensional space and trying to explain why the predictor returned a given value. And you know, to sort of give some context to this, what I really like to think about when I'm thinking about interpretability of a machine learning model is actually use an analogy. I, I, when I was at the National Cancer Institute, I did a lot of work in drug development on preclinical and early phase drug development. And I think the analogy is very similar there. You know, in the preclinical drug development world, you know, we get these new agents coming in all the, day, all the time and we don't necessarily know what they do or what is their mechanism or, you know, do they do anything? Um, and what we do is we're running a series of experiments to try to understand for this new agent, what is its mechanism of action? You know, we can do kinase screens, we can do, um, you know, pharmacodynamic or pharmacogenomic studies. You know, we run a series of tests on that new agent to try to understand what it's doing, you know, is what is it binding to, you know, is it inhibiting it or is it overexpressing? You know, if, if it's a kinase inhibitor, will it impact the whole pathway by knocking down, um, you know, a certain gene um, or a certain protein? And so, you know, in drug development, we have this idea of trying to understand a mechanism of action, but it's often at a global level. You know, if I think about that idea of a kinase, you know, I may have a drug that I know, you know, not is, um, you know, inhibits BRAF. 
But now I have a new patient, a specific patient coming in that the drug worked for. For that given patient, it can be very difficult to infer why, the, why that drug worked for them. You know, if you think about the idea, you know, I'll, I'll stick with the example of kinase inhibitors. We know that kinase inhibitors tend to not be specific. And so it may be that for this given patient, they're, we're overexpressing BRAF and that's why the drug worked for them. It may be that they had something upstream that, you know, went through a different mechanism or a parallel pathway that that um, drug happened to also inhibit that happened to be the reason why that specific patient responded to the drug. And so there are cases where we're able to do that, but there are cases where it can be very difficult. And I think it's a similar scenario when we're dealing with machine learning interpretability, that globally, we can come up with a lot of rules for why things work globally and what information is informative and is a variable even being used at all um for you know for you know for doing the prediction of the outcome or for the causal average treatment effect but when we get down to the local level for a given patient why is it returning that prediction i think that becomes a much harder problem to um to come up with valid interpretations where we're not just sort of reverse engineering you know we're tricking ourselves um, that we have interpretability of that model and you know, not to say that interpretability isn't important. Um, it can be a very important step of evaluating a machine learning model. Um, one of the, the areas where I think interpret these methods for interpretability have been most important is actually in number two here of diagnosing quality issues. Um, you know, we use the common example of, uh, you know, an example where someone was training um, images of MRI scans of the brain where certain centers were putting a marker on the forehead to differentiate left versus right on those brain scans. And, you know, they were doing that because, you know, making sure that the, the scans were flipped, but it was only one center was doing that. Um, and a multi-center data set was used to train an algorithm. But that one center had a very different risk population. And the model was sort of picking up that this little marker and it was you know, using that to predict the outcome for patients, even though that had nothing causally related to the problem that we were interested in. It just happened to be that we we're using data from that center that incorporated that. And so some of these interpretability metrics can pick up on things where you know, the algorithm is using something it probably shouldn't be using, or it's more exogenous to the causal relationship underlying what's going on, and we need to go and fix that. And so these interpretability tools can be really helpful in diagnosing quality issues um, at a global level um, and you know, sort of diagnosing where we may have issues in transportability, um, but they may be less informative of, you know, at that local level saying for this given patient, why was it predicted one way versus the other? And I just want to give an example. You know, we often talk about that linear regression is easy to interpret. Um, but I want to sort of challenge that a little bit. So you know, if we think about the, the standard example where expectational Y as a function, as a function of A and X, and we have an interaction term um, between A and X1. Um, sort of showing heterogeneity of treatment effect. The effect of treatment A varies by the value of X1. And so, you know, we could say, well, how do I interpret beta three? Well, we could, you know, go and plot this function. I could, you know, put in specific values where, you know, the, the estimate of uh, that interaction term between A and X1 was two. And I could plot this. I could say, you know, what does this actually look like? And I have an example drawn here, you know, over X1 as it varies from zero to two. Uh, that's sort of the range within my data set that I'm interested in. I can plot what the two regression lines would look like where my y-axis here is the expectation of y under treatment zero and treatment one. And let's say that higher values of y are good. And so what I can see is that it looks like, you know, treatment zero works better up until x1 crosses 1.5. And then there is a flip of the sign of the treatment effect difference, where beyond x1 and 1.5, um, a, a treatment a1 looks better. And so I can, you know, I'm sort of interpreting this. 
But what is going on behind the scenes is this is assuming I can move x1 without x2 changing. And that may not always be the case. You know, because this is a multivariable regression model, I may not always be able to you know, do a one unit increase in x1 without x2 changing. Because if I'm splitting across this line, maybe you know x2 and x1 are highly correlated. And so it may not look like this depending on what the patient's value of x2 is. And so I may need to modify that. So even in a simple linear regression example, because the variables may be correlated with each other and I can't do the usual interpretation that holding one variable constant as I move the other one, may not always make sense within the clinical context. And I need to be thinking more about the holistic view of, you know, is this patient that has this profile of X1 and X2, how are they gonna differ from another patient? Or if I modify X1, if that's modifiable, what's the impact gonna be on X2? And so here's my you know, simple example from the linear regression, but, you know, a lot of my spaces in radiology where my data isn't X1s and X2s, my data is an MRI. And I can't think about simple parametric functions of this you know, brain MRI and how it's predicting the prognosis or the treatment effect for that individual. So what am I going to do? And in the literature, there's this idea of you know, if I'm going to fit a, here, I'll move that, uh, so you're not <laughs> getting dizzy staring at the MRI. There's this idea of looking at a um, what's called a saliency map, where the, you know the, the machine learning model, a convolutional neural network, we can look at the gradients within each pixel of that image and say which of those pixels, you know, if I perturb them slightly, are going to have an impact of on the the predicted outcome. And the literature often you know focuses on these types of images, these heat maps you see here on the side as interpretability of what the convolutional neural network or what the machine learning model is picking up on to predict the outcome. But we have to you take these with a bit of grain of salt, because again, this is at that um, sort of patient specific level. And one of the things that these are doing mathematically is that they're looking at the gradient within a pixel, that if I modify a pixel slightly, how's that gonna change uh, my predicted outcome? But the problem we have with you know, going in there and pixel by pixel moving um, values on that MRI image is that that doesn't really represent what would be a plausible um, MRI brain scan. And so I like to think about this a little bit more abstractly, where I could think about you know, within this space, this is all the possible uh, compositions of pixels that make up an MRI and all the different grayscale values. But the actual characteristics that would be considered a valid MRI are a very small manifold within that entire space. And so you can imagine, you know, my patient's MRI would be sitting here within that space and it's a valid MRI. But I'm applying these methods for doing saliency maps or interpretability maps of that image. It's looking at derivations from that. And it may be perturbing out side of what is a valid MRI. And if I'm moving outside of what a valid MRI is and saying that's the interpretability of my model, that starts to, you know, you start to lose confidence in those methods that, you know, yes, you could say there's a gradient that if I shift these, it's going to impact my prediction, but that's not a valid MRI anymore. And so that's not really interpreting something that I'm actually interested in. I'm interested in if, if I stayed within this MRI space, what would that interpretability be? But the problem is most of our machine learning algorithms, we can't enforce staying within a valid MRI. That's a really hard problem to put a restriction on a machine learning algorithm. And, and you know, this is something we learned a long time ago when we were trying to uh, you know, build simulation models of, um, of radiological images. One of the things we would do is we would build a model, a computer simulated uh, MRI scan, and we'd have a real one. And we'd put them in front of radiologists and say, which one was real and which one was fake? And we'd ask them to distinguish. 
And this was similar to what Che was talking about with the, uh, the adversarial networks, the GANs earlier. We were doing this manually in, with radiologists where we would build a simulation model, present two images, and try to trick the radiologist to say that this looks like a real MRI, but it's not. It's coming from a generative model. And it, as we train these up, we're able to try to reconstruct that manifold space of what is valid MRI scans. And then I can go back in and sort of now I have this generative model of what's valid and what's not valid based on you know, doing that sort of mechanical effort of comparing images and what looks real and what's not. And then with that generative model, I can go in and say, what's an image an MRI image that's close to my patient's image, but has a different prediction value and how does that differ? And that's gonna get us closer. We're not quite there yet. This is something we're working on, um, but this is where I think we need to go as we run to try to improve interpretability methods, uh, especially within the medical context, um, but it's, it's a hard problem. Uh, so real quick, I know I'm running low on time. I'll go, I'll go through clinical utility real quick. Um, one thing is that, you know, even though we may have estimated um, the, uh, uh, the, the Kate model, the conditional amateur treatment effect from observational data, a great way of testing those is actually to go back to a randomized clinical trial to actually evaluate the implementation and the utility of a treatment decision rule. One of the things is that estimating that model often requires a much larger data set than testing whether it works or not. And so this may be an opportunity to move back into a randomized clinical trial. And I'll just, um, you know, here's a schematic of that where you, know, you have a patient and instead of randomizing to a treatment or randomizing to a drug, we randomize patients to a strategy where you know, strategy A might be use our treatment strategy that we estimated from the observational data, and strategy B might be standard of care, physician's choice, or a random allocation of the drug. And then we look forward to assess the outcome on those patients, and we see whether strategy A improves the outcome compared to strategy B. And so this is the standard randomized strategy trial design. And I, just an example of one of these that I did when I was at NCI was the NCI impact study, where we enrolled patients with advanced cancer from 2014 through 2018. And we had four different treatment options, but we didn't randomize patients to the treatment options. They were randomized to the treatment decision algorithm that was used. And we had one algorithm or one arm of that study, which was based on an assumption of heterogeneous treatment effects based on baseline, baseline characteristics from the patient and tumor mutations. And then we had an algorithm that said, you know, given these characteristics, we think this drug is going to work better than the other drugs. And then the other arm was treatment based on a random selection of available sets, which for advanced patient cancers, this would be basically standard of care. And so we randomized patients to these two strategies where the primary outcome was the objective response rate, and this was published recently um, in Chen et al., where this, this example ended up being a negative study where we did find a difference in objective responses, response rates between these two treatment strategies in this clinical trial. But it's a nice example of how you can do randomized studies of treatment strategies in contrast to randomized studies for treatment options. Um, and then just real quick in summary, many different approaches uh, exist for using machine learning for estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. And we talked a little bit about pros and cons of those different approaches. An important thing to remember as we're bringing in machine learning is we need to be very aware of cross-validation and sample splitting. They're almost always going to be required. Um, and often, you know, in real practice, we have a nested layer of cross-validation going on uh, to get those valid inference at the end. Important to think about the loss function of the various steps of the estimation and evaluation. Things like you know, the best means algorithm with the mean squared error may not be best for my uh, treatment effect estimate. And we need to balance those two uh, when evaluating um, within a context of our data. Current interpretability methods are helpful, but often limited. Um, they're often a first step on this journey to shine a light into that black box. Um, but we may see what shadows they're going to cast. They're not completely um, going to explain everything to us that we may want them to. And so there's room for improvements on those methods. 
Uh, modern statistical methods can be used to estimate treatment effects from observational studies, but to actually evaluate the clinical utility and the implementation of them, those may require clinical trials. Though the, the clinical utility is a lot harder to assess in an observational study. And as in many areas of medicine, if we're implementing a machine learning model, these often require monitoring over time for changes in the distribution or changes in how they're used that may, uh, we may need to update the model. And so as we're thinking about these in practice, we need to make sure that we have that monitoring, uh, monitoring plan in place prior to implementation. And so with that, I'll stop sharing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pauli, for this super informative and interesting presentations. Uh, as Jenny mentioned in the, uh, the chat box, as we're behind schedule, so we will um, now skip the Q&A and as well as the virtual break and go directly to our last presentation and then we'll have our Q&A all together. So our, our last speaker today is Dr. Babark Mantazavi. He's Assistant Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Texas A&M University. Prior to the current position, he, he served as a postdoc associate in the section of cardiovascular medicine, Department of Internal Medicine at the Yale School of Medicine. His research focuses on the intersection of wearable technology, machine learning, and cardiovascular-focused clinical outcome research to develop longitudinal personalized models of health. He leads numerous studies supported by the National Science Foundation, NIH, and DARPA. Today, he will cover two topics. The first one is about generalizability and transportability. And the second one is about promise and limitations of causal AI. Dr. Matazavi, please take it away from here. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and thanks for everybody for uh, joining us today. I will uh, do my best to make up a bit of time here in terms of uh, where we're going um, by both talking about how we can extend some of the machine learning tasks that we've learned about today uh, to the more general challenges of using um, causal methods, particularly in observational data, and then at the end touch a little bit about some of the just newest techniques that probably help us uh, work on this. So I'm going to go over a uh, brief introduction on the techniques that we're using you know, and, and what are the key causal terms. Um, there's a lot of sort of definitions to start. And then really, what are the challenges that we think the machine learning techniques can overcome? Um, uh, this is sort of a um, a lit review of lit reviews, if you will. Uh, so uh, I have some references at the end and, and, and point uh, everybody to um, some of the, the great work by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sherry Rose uh, Sanford and, and uh, Mahila Vandershar um, of uh, Oxford and UCLA that are sort of looking at the two ends of the spectrum of the techniques that we're gonna talk about today. And I will also sort of ground it in a, uh, in a case study that we ran through the Yale uh, Searcy efforts. Um, so right, as, as we're all aware, uh, the biggest challenge um, here is in understanding the average treatment of effect from what are, you know, designed through randomized control trials where we have very homogenized patient types, even distributions of trial designs and, and uh, assignments to treatment groups that are, that are purely random. So the sample distribution of the treatment arm versus the control arm are the same so that you can really um, uh, differentiate outcomes as a direct effect of the treatment and not any sort of unmeasured confounders. Uh, the problem we have with, with these, or the challenge, uh, I should say, is... Um, you know, they're expensive to set up. It's challenging to get the right uh, cohorts, the right trial design. And uh, fundamentally, uh, they tend to be very homogenized in the patient types. So you have trouble with what we're calling external validity. So how well can you then generalize this to the regular populations, right? Uh, but in real world data, in the observational data, for everything that we gain uh, by removing the constraints on, on RCTs, we, we uh, run into brand new challenges, right? So we have more realistic patient data and representations. Uh, you know, we can look across all kinds of patients uh, in which we've captured data and the numbers of comorbidities they have, the kind of different lifestyles, et cetera, uh, with the routinely collected data that's generated on all of them. But then we have a lot of sort of confounding bias. Uh, observationally, as these patients are being treated, different 
um, treatment strategies we run, different data will be gathered. And so people start to look more and more different and it becomes harder and harder to estimate treatment effects when there are a series now of unmeasured confounders that, that, that generate bias in um, the different sample spaces that we're looking at. So it requires a bunch of different modeling assumptions to determine the internal validity, whether, whether even within a cohort of people that we're looking at, whether uh, we can match and understand um, treatment effects. So uh, to set up, you know, it's a, it's a little bit math heavy on some of these slides and text heavy, and I apologize for that, but just sort of formulations that uh, really carry through, uh, you know, what we're familiar with here. You know, you, you consider every trial or every design, every model that we're trying to, to evaluate as a function of sort of five key parameters, right? X is all of your input data. These are all the things that we're measuring and everybody, and then your Y0 versus Y1 are basically your outcomes based on whether you are receiving the treatment or not. And, you know, and the hope is to really understand the difference between these two Ys based on A, an assignment of whether you receive that treatment, and then S, whether you are uh, within the same sort of sample population that we're modeling. Assuming you have all of that data, the goal then is to you know, capture the average treatment effect, as we've heard. Uh, one of the keys to the observational data, though, is that, that the sample space might not... Uh, might not be the same, right? So, so your likelihood of receiving a treatment based on what a, a clinician is seeing is going to vary. And so as a result, you need to also consider an extra factor here, right? Which is the propensity of being treated. So uh, given the likelihood of be, being treated, given your data, can I then figure out uh, the average treatment effect? Because it's sort of unfair to compare people that wouldn't receive a treatment because uh, they have contraindications or something. From that come out two key terms, which is really the focus of, of both the presentation and the material here and really the promise of sort of the future directions as we're going forward, right? Is one is generalizability. So given a study that I generate and I compute the conditional average treatment effects and I understand the probabilities of the outcomes given a set of populations, how well can I generate generalize this to other samples, other populations? So how well can I look at other unmeasured, other measured uh, factors on different patients and understand their likelihood of having been in the same sample of what I'm generating here versus looking different than the people that were in my initial study and how I can adapt um, my estimates to them. And then transportability is and how do I really go and shift away if those people don't match in the same sample. So if, if my randomized control trial or my original observational study has a sort of cohort of patients that do not represent then other cohorts of patients, how well can I adapt what I've learned from one to the other uh, and how do I impact that. So those are the two sort of key techniques here that, you know, we have to then make modeling assumptions to move forward uh, in terms of working on that, right? So, so again, taking um, from Deg Tier and Rose here, it's a great figure that sort of says that the challenge behind any sort of analysis sample that you have here is both understanding the internal validity of the data. So how well uh, you know, how well does your study actually prove what you needed to prove? And then how well can you then take it out and transport it out externally to understand how this can be generalized to more po wide range of populations that maybe have different data gathered on them? Um, and then what we're going to do, like I said, is there's a lot of definitions in that every now and then I'll try to come back and ground it to a case study that we ran. So a case study that we ran uh, is really looking at myocardial infarction patients that have um, complications with cardiogenic shock and the use of intraortic balloon pumps versus uh, uh, micro LVAD devices, uh, impella device, and figuring out how looking at a retrospective cohort of observational data collected through the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, can we figure out treatment effects of the two devices here on patients with card undergoing cardiogenic shock and to figure out uh, that effect on the outcome? Um, so that's sort of the setup for, for the whole talk here. So what we need to then understand is, again, a little bit of a deeper dive in terms of what it means to have your internal validity and your external validity. And then from there, we'll talk about how you select the right patient populations. And then it will sort of conclude with uh, what are some of the big data techniques that let us sort of extrapolate more interesting findings uh, than perhaps we've done thus far. All right, so, so right here, to really under, identify sort of your bias and understand internal and external validity, you have to really consider a few key things. So given a study that you are trying to extend from, you need to know what was measured, 
what the population looks like. And then on your secondary target population, how different do they look? What kind of assumptions are you making in terms of the validity of data collected on one population versus the other and how similar are those? And then from there, if you can do that, you can evaluate whether treatment effects really can be extended across the different populations. And if not, what sort of parametric uh, restrictions do you need to put on the case to then estimate uh, the potential for these effects? Um, so for the internal validity, right, the idea here is that I may have the same sort of treatment groups, but what if I'm not collecting the same sets of data that the randomized control trials do or on, on vice versa? What if the randomized control trials didn't collect as much data as I have now potentially available observationally? Um, there might be confounders between the treatment groups, even if the sample population looks the same. So what I need to do is I need to then be able to figure out somehow uh, that there's some consistency between what I think is the likelihood of a person receiving a treatment and the outcomes that would be associated with that treatment versus if they don't receive the treatment, the sets of outcomes that they would have. So this is sort of a matching technique. If I can figure out uh, that the only shift on the outcome is a function of the treatment and not other measurements, then I have some sort of internal validity that my samples are the same and I can really quickly estimate the average treatment of effect. All right, so this right now is right what we get through um, perfect randomization through our, our uh, RCTs. But when we move to observational data, that assumption falls apart, right? So when we get to then trying to go out to external validity and looking at different data and different type of populations, we have problems with respect to subject characteristics, with the types of health centers that are going to, the treatment flows that they go through in their care encounters, as well as the treatments themselves that they're receiving, the timing, the dos this dosage, um, and the staff training when it comes to uh, very specific sort of you know, invasive techniques. And as a result of that, then how well can I track outcomes, right? So if you have patients that are bouncing around between different medical centers, you might not have the right lengths of follow-up to understand what the potential outcomes are. And all of these things then confuse and confound the ability to take what was found, learned in the RCTs and apply them in general settings, right? So, so the idea here is there's a couple of key terms that we then have to look at assumptions and figure out how we deal with the loosening of these assumptions, right? So for, for dealing with patients that we know are in the same condition, but maybe we have the same data, we need to know if the additional data or lack of data uh, are confounding measurements that could be related to the outcome, or if they're just superfluous sort of historical data. And then we need to know the positivity of the treatment assignment. So we need to basically say, if we want to be able to extend, we, we need to know that the likelihood of receiving a treatment is based on uh, the data that you have. Effectively, can I match the likelihood that you would receive a treatment with the types of people that did receive the treatment so that I can relate them and say that you're the same? If not, then I have a problem here where observationally a, a clinician is seeing something different in you and it's not fair to then guess the treatment effect on you when there's you know contraindicating uh, effects. Uh, if I can do that, I have to be able to consider then a lot of different ways of scoring myself um, you know, and we, we're all familiar with techniques of weighting and matching, but really what I need to consider to be able to really generalize results to impact uh, observational um, average treatments of effects, I have to consider the time perspective over what periods of time I'm looking at the data that's being gathered, how well I can generalize the lengths and the conditions that exist, how well can I score or not score and match participants based on the data, and then how well um, can I evaluate the different confounders that I have and, and, and the measurements that I might have that are available in a general population, but not maybe in a homogenized, restricted, sort of randomized uh, control trial setting. So what I need to then do is figure out exactly that last point. How do I figure out what those measurements are and change the way I evaluate treatment of effects based on the potential of additional uh, measurements that didn't exist in one population to another? Uh, so if, if the observational data can be shown to match, then I'm, I'm great. But what's more interesting, right, for us and the techniques that we're developing are situations when it doesn't match. If it doesn't match, then I have to adjust my treatment of effect from simply being the likelihood of the outcome from people that received the treatment versus the likelihood of the outcome of people that didn't receive the treatment, scaling that information now by the treatment assignment itself and how likely you are to have received that treatment. So given your measurements prior to a treatment decision point, what was the likelihood that somebody looked at you and said, yeah, I think this 
drug, for example, or this intervention is suitable versus isn't, because if it was decided that it's not suitable, then I can't take your potential outcome as a, as a measure of the likelihood of a treatment effect, because there's something different in terms of you that is, is not suitable to, you know, measuring uh, the total sets of outcomes. And, and the way to look at this is really looking at sort of very simple dependency graphs. So if you have an input data X and an output data Y, say in, in sample A, what you have here is a very basic setup where the assumption here is that um, uh, receiving a sample, being part of the sample and receiving a treatment or not, is sort of independent of what your condition is or not. That, that gives you a nice, very randomized setting of there is maybe something observational that decides to give you a treatment or not, but at the end of the day, uh, your outcome is somewhat independent. Um, you can then have sort of setting B where you say, well, now there, there's, there's more observational impacts and effects here. So your data and the measure that's, that I have on you and your confounders both impact whether I think you're suitable to receive an eligible treatment. And then as a result, what I think your likely outcome is. But even in that setting, uh, we have still a simple way of comparing because then in that setting, I can match whether I think you should receive a treatment and I just remove everybody who I don't think should receive the treatment. So this is easy to delete, uh, you know, individuals in a data set that have obvious contraindications. The challenges then come in looking at sort of C, D, E, and F here, which is as I start to add more parameters, add more uh, measurements of ages, of, of prior histories, of uh, different condition states and different treatment decisions that had been made up until this point, I start to see a lot more dependencies on input X versus output Y and whether I consider you to be in a sample or out of a sample and how I would make a treatment distribution, treatment decision, right? And so the more that these graphs become more complicated, the harder it becomes to then decide that a potential outcome Y is a function of both your, your input data X and whether you received a treatment A versus all of these other potential effects that now are impacting your outcomes that, that weren't considered or were sort of controlled against in, uh, in the original trials. So what I need then, right, is a number of different techniques that we have at our disposal uh, is to really understand before I can do this, how to sort of separate out people that have very differing data and really only look within groups of data that people that sort of look similar and would have been likely to receive the treatment and did or didn't for uh, almost what would appear to be randomized reasons, right? So you can do this through weighing of samples and outcomes or, or really the most common approach at the moment is some form of propensity score matching. And you can view this as sort of in a linear setting of saying, I want to look at the likelihood of receiving a treatment or not and really effectively throw away the tails in these distributions. So how do I look at people that received the treatment versus people that didn't receive a treatment and find the people that were sort of similar in the measurements of the, all of the measures that we've captured on them and whether they received a treatment or not then almost looks like more of a random decision. Um, obviously, you want to match people sort of one to one to then say I'm going to throw away all the other people in the hopes here that the data that was gathered is everything representative of the patient that helped make the treatment decision. And the way you can do that then is say, if I can just generate these groups, can I build a model that accurately guesses whether you would receive a treatment and effectively throws away the people that very obviously are yeses versus very obviously are noes, because those are ones where obviously clinical decision-making from the data uh, finds sort of contraindications. But if I can generate that, I can then start to do more complex things with sort of machine learning techniques. I can look at the matching of these um, likelihoods over time. So rather than try to take a very linear approach here that just says, do I think I have a treatment effect or not? And based on the data that I have, the likelihood of receiving a treatment, can I start looking at this at, at, at more and more refined settings? And so this is where we start to move away from the more classical biostatistical approaches of propensity score matching and then treatment uh, effectiveness evaluation by trying to look at this now less as an average treatment effect and potentially more as an individualized treatment effect. So how do I know from the kinds of data that I have, can I generate the likelihood of receiving a treatment for each subset of patients, right? So for each subgroup of trainable data, can I look at recursively and recurrently looking at this and updating my estimate of giving you a treatment based on the data that you have that's being generated? So as more data is gathered on you, your representation might change. And if your representation might change, my notion of matching you to other people changes. And I need to then constantly and recurrently update this estimate. 
Um, more importantly, what I can do through sort of these deep networks or machine learning techniques is sort of rapidly group you with people that look similar to you and that within those local regions, say that the treatment uh, assignment looks almost randomized so I can make decisions rather than again, look at the average on the whole population. So, so returning back to sort of our case study here, uh, in particular, we use a, a tree-based um, technique. And this tree-based technique, this gradient descent boosted decision tree technique, really looks at the likelihood of receiving treatments, not as sort of just a standard sort of linear model, but looks at a divide and conquer approach that takes each sort of patient population and separates them out into groups of individuals that look more and more similar. And if I can take each pathway of each tree, I can sort of figure out who you look similar to in the sort of terminal nodes of each tree. And I can look across a bunch of trees that look across different sets of confounders. And if I can do that, I uh, argue that you potentially get a stronger matching technique that better measures um, your likelihood of receiving a treatment, your propensity of receiving the treatment. And then from there, being able to then capture the average treatment effect. So that was a lot of sort of high level mess. Let's come back to our case study and ground example of how a machine learning technique can potentially improve upon this. So we look at patients that are admitted into a, into a medical system with uh, myocardial infarction uh, complicated by cardiogenic shock. And we're looking at the potential of having just a medical intervention treatment decision versus using an intra or balloon pump versus using uh, an impella device, uh, which was the, the sort of key work that we were doing through the yale Circe. Uh, Mayo uh, organization here. Uh, and, and what we did is we had to look at this at two different things. The first one is not all places have access to the, the micro LVAD device, uh, the Impella device. So that right there immediately becomes a, a subset of people that you can't consider in your treatment effects because just because they didn't receive the Impella had nothing to do with their measured data or their patient state or their condition. It had everything to do with the fact the hospital system wasn't trained to use the device or didn't have the device at all. But, so what we looked at is we went back and looked at retrospective data and tried to generate it across as much data as possible. So rather than sort of standardize this to a few uh, measures of what we think is the clinical severity of an individual with cardiogenic shock, we looked at different registries that look at all kinds of conditions of what kind of AMI they had, how their condition was, how their labs varied over both initial labs that exist in the sort of chest pain in my registry and the peak labs that are gathered recurrently throughout an admission. And we tried to match patients across these registries and determine if we can find a subset that looks similar enough in terms of severity and condition that could have received either um, invasive device to then look at the treatment effect of those devices. So, you know, we looked through the registries, we matched a, a decent number of participants here uh, across a decent number of hospitals. And then what we did was we sort of evaluated this subset of people that actually could have been at a hospital that received one or the other. Because if it was a hospital that system that only uses and is trained to use one type of device versus another type of device, that right there is an unmeasured confounder that doesn't exist in electronic medical data. But is a direct impact on whether you're likely to be in the sample population or not. So it's unfair to compare outcomes in those subsets of patients. But if we, if we separate this down to patients that received mechanical circulatory support devices in systems that could assign one or the other, then we look at whether there are systems that looked at only having just an impella device, just an intraortic balloon pump, or some of the other devices that exist or are no uh, device, medical device, medical interventions and such. And what we look at is then these two subsets of patients saying these uh, decent number of patients that exist between hospitals that could have multiple sets of patients and multiple sets of treatment devices and are then deciding treatment A versus treatment B more on a decision-making of condition and measurements that exist and not on whether their staff has training or whether they have access to the devices allows us to create a sample population that's a little more homogenized and likely to be uh, a fair comparison. We then from that subset had to create a propensity score matching, but we did this through uh, our tree-based method. So rather than looking at just sort of a general propensity, we look at dividing and conquering each of these patients to match similarly of the likelihood of receiving treatment A versus B through the tree-based methods. So what it does is it creates local regions of 
matches of people that look similar to each other based on different sets of conditions. So effectively, how do you evaluate the risk of the patients of having, say, uh, major adverse bleeding or uh, more in-hospital mortality through a different set of uh, driving risk factors? And from there, we can sort of assess the cohort similarity. So we, we did this through the standard propensity matching, but using the tree-based technique to better match these individuals. And then we compared you know, the standard techniques of looking at mean differences across the cohorts and understanding if their uh, outcome differences are similar, et cetera. And from there, we came up with uh, pairs of matched patients, which actually matched, managed to match almost everybody in the data set that received an Impella device. And the standard mean differences between these were actually uh, were quite low. So from there, we were able to look at the devices and see that, um, you know, in terms of favoring intraortic balloon pump versus Impella, the, the, the interesting finding is that adjusting for a number of these techniques to try to come up with the average treatment effect in what is sort of as most uh, fair comparison as possible, we find that um, it seemed that the, the treatments favor the intraortic balloon pump over the Impella device, despite sort of the discussion that the Impella is better suited for those that are at higher risk. Uh, we tried to account for all the features that account for high risk and, and, and the data didn't seem to show that. So uh, Impella was associated with significantly higher mortality and bleeding. Um, so the question then is, well, is that a, is that a conclusive finding or, or is there still something unmeasured? Um, so the, the, the issue here is that ultimately, even in our divide and conquer approach, we're still matching down to a single propensity score that is a vote across a bunch of different kinds of decision trees. Uh, you're still missing potential heterogeneity. Uh, so how do you account for that? And this is where um, we look at, uh, so I'll just speed up a little bit here in terms of um, the talk just for timing purposes. We look at the potential across bigger data techniques and machine learning techniques to sort of even take it one step further of even potential constraints that still existed in our study that maybe limit the findings um, and saying, can we do something even broader? So if the biggest argument is that patients that receive Impella are those that were at higher risk of mortality to begin with, and that even our matching is potentially not showing that, one of the natural questions becomes, are there techniques at our disposal that can both look at the propensity to receive a treatment and jointly understand risk of mortality so that you can justify that the selection of variables here is accounting for both who is at high risk and then matching others that are at high risk but that receive the other treatment. So, um, so what we do here is actually, we look at the potential of looking at a whole breadth of data to generate uh, even more complex machine learning techniques that can jointly learn. So unlike a lot of different techniques that may sort of model for a single outcome or a single label, uh, some of the more machine learning techniques that we have at our disposal these days and these deep neural net techniques allow us to jointly learn uh, different outcomes at the same time. So what I can do is I can learn a distribution of the likelihood of matching. So basically these tree-based things, but divide and conquer based on the likelihood of uh, estimating mortality here. So what happens is as doing this as a hierarchical model rather than a two-stage approach where we sort of instrument the likelihood of receiving a variable and then and, and then the likelihood of dying from that to see if the, the measurements and the confounders that we use are the same, we let the machine sort of iterate through this and say, can I figure out how to take a general population, divide and conquer it to people who are receiving, uh, arriving at risk at this, for the same reasons and then estimate risk in those specific subsetted reasons. And if I can, I can, I can match who is similar based on things that are driving risk factors and show that that model is accurate at modeling risk. And if I can, I get around this concern that you're still potentially missing uh, unmeasured confounders and not really estimating who's at high risk and who isn't. So uh, the key here is to sort of jointly learn both the potential for the distribution of who you are similar to and match in local regions, and then predict. So given who you were assigned to, then can I predict your outcomes given that, uh, that, that distribution here? Um, and, and so uh, again, sorry, just to go forward, what we can look at is we can apply some of these joint learning techniques to our, our, our data set to argue that there are potentially uh, more fine-grained treatment effects here and that may be looking at the average treatment effect 
And the conditional average treatment effect isn't the way to go, but maybe we can start to personalize this treatment effect a little bit more. So we go through and we scored how well we think uh, there are different groups of individuals um, to find the right number and regularized clusters, because at the end of the day, if you give this so much data, everybody looks like their own individual and that's not super helpful and having everybody in one big cluster isn't super helpful. So we, we looked at effectively all sets of what are commonly identified through the, our cardiology uh, consult uh, collaborators uh, as potentially high measures of what would generate high risk, how they would be making treatment decisions in their interventions. Uh, so everything that would potentially be included in the registry data that could define a patient at high risk or not a high risk to see if we're appropriately matching uh, impella patients with the right IABP patients. And we come out with sort of five clusters here where there's one really big cluster of sort of your obvious cases and then a bunch of uh, neighborhood clusters of patients that are actually uniquely different and need to be matched in their own subsets. And then honestly, potential outliers where we have to admit that we probably don't have enough people in statistical power here to make uh, decisions off of what's happening here, right? So if I can divide this out, then maybe I can have a better description of what's going on observationally and look at treatment effects within each of these specific clusters. So I can look at who are in these clusters, what treatments they had and what outcomes they had. And, and from this, uh, sorry, from this, I can, I can match this, sorry, with the prior side of looking at the different mortality rates in these clusters and saying, I can effectively understand outcome rates, risk of outcome rates and treatment effects in these rates. And then from there, I have more defined subsets that I can, that I can propensity match to. Uh, and what this starts to provide as a potential uh, next step is to extend beyond that, right? So even in this clinical registry setting, we have very clean defined clinical observational data. Um, and ultimately what we've been finding is that it, it does not seem like um, the findings match what has sort of been originally concluded that the devices are potentially helping in those that are in severe uh, state of illness. Uh, and, and, and some of the, we've used it as somewhat be hypothesis generating, suggesting that maybe you need a more controlled designed randomized trial for the Impella device to show where it really uh, improves cases, because at least observationally understanding that risk doesn't help. If you have that observational data matched with randomized data, you could actually construct even uh, broader te techniques that can figure out how to measure effect estimates by learning from one to another. So how do you transfer from understanding the randomized trials to this observational data to make sure that you are indeed uh, capturing everything that is being argued as generating sort of who is at high risk and very severe and should be the target population for an intervention device. Uh, if you can generate that data, it turns out that you can actually improve upon the potential uh, of understanding the distributions of all these confounders by actually generating more data. So given what your observational data looks like here and what your randomized controlled trial data looks like, you can learn a mapping to figure out what's missing and what isn't. And from there, be able to generate a whole distribution of people to pre-train your data. You can pre-train your models by effectively simulating what the counterfactual would look like without having it, because you have at your breadth a large set of observational data from which you can learn all kinds of things given the deep network techniques, but you have your randomized trial to sort of control what is the original matching of you know, receiving treatment versus not and being able to actually explain the counterfactual. And so from this, sort of machine learning techniques allow us to start to simulate the counterfactuals to sort of prime our networks to better learn um, uh, better propensity matching techniques. Um, and so really that's sort of the promise here um, of what we can do with these techniques is how do we do that generation and match things better uh, with the, the use of machine learning techniques or perhaps we had some limitations prior to it. So how do we prime these things to really generate those kind of counterfactuals and really better understand what a patient state looks like and who would be and wouldn't be in a sample population uh, from observational data. Uh, the, the current sort of architectures that are being developed really allow us to do this in a way that we hadn't been able to up until now. So we think there's a promise here of overcoming the sort of repeated causation versus correlation kind of mistakes that are being made 
through machine learning techniques that have been applied to medicine early on. Um, and, and the key here comes through a, a deeper patient representation. If I can better understand the distribution of what patients look like and the kinds of data that they have, then I can even better estimate on measured confounders and the impact they have on, on a patient's state. And I can jointly learn treatment effects and outcomes. And if I can jointly learn this, I run away from potential criticisms of not appropriately identifying risk of outcomes given different stages of pre and post treatments by being able to pre-train networks with simulated sort of counterfactual based data. And if I can learn this, I can actually extend this beyond our standard matching and single treatment effectiveness to looking at multiple treatments and multiple outcomes at, uh, across uh, different spectrums, assuming that again, that the models that I developed at the end show uh, robust um, accuracy measurements. And so I can do this through uh, the beauty of multitask learning, right? So I can, I can provide a network with multiple outputs that I want to estimate both the propensity to match something as well as the likelihood of an outcome. And by understanding measures that drive matching versus measures that drive outcomes, I can potentially um, learn in an underlying architecture uh, the subset of features that both represent risk and what drove the treatment decision making. And from, if I can do that, I can better match and, and drive home that I can actually match observational people and make treatment effectiveness decisions off of them because I am learning the subset of parameters that both drive propensity and risk if they're related to each other. Um, and so by being able to do this through some of the deep network techniques that we have at our disposal now, we can, uh, we can learn sort of direct parameter sharing from that. And from there, we can sort of incorporate assumptions and domain knowledge when data lets us down or, or, or pre-train it with synthetic data saying, we, we expect this counterfactual type individual to exist even if we don't have it in our original data set. And so we, we can then learn this in a sparse manner and interpret it a little bit as well. Um, this sort of goes back to some of the things that you heard earlier of what does it really mean to interpret and regularize sort of the subsets of features that are doing, because the more I throw into these deep network techniques, the, the harder it is to understand what's going on. You end up in more of a black box scenario. Um, but what I can do is I can capture relatedness across the likelihood of having a propensity of getting a treatment as well as the likelihood of an outcome given your same driving risk factors uh, without knowledge of whether you receive that treatment or not. Um, by sort of finding what are the underlying basis vectors, sort of like effectively uh, automating a sort of a principal component analysis here on which you can identify what are the basis variables that really drive an understanding of risk and the understanding of treatment decisions so that in an observational setting, you can understand what was going on through uh, the course of clinical care. And if you, can, if you can do this, you can actually then apply this to uh, sort of the mixture type models that we were talking about earlier, the ensemble techniques in which you can actually cluster people who are similar through that. Uh, and you can either cluster and then apply the multitask learning, or you can apply the multitask learning and then, you know, cluster based on the different representations that are embedded for each individual uh, to, to sort of have what we would consider to be a more robust matching technique. Uh, and if you can do that, you can then apply uh, some of the explainable techniques. Again, that was touched on earlier. So for the interest of time, I'll sort of jump through this. The thing that allows us to do the, the most here though, is really be able to transfer. So that, that allows for the sort of generalizability of all models. The last techniques here that we have at our disposal allow us to transfer, uh, improve the transportability. So when you have settings in which you don't have the same sets of measures and you really can't make those differentiations between what was a, a randomized trial that looked at a treatment effect and a new population that looks slightly different and you want to be able to estimate whether a drug will work in this setting or not. Um, what you have to have is the ability to transfer just the last bit of information here. So if you can take those same multitask architectures, you can leave all the pre-trained settings from the synthetic data and from other data sets fixed. And what you can do is you can, with very minimal new data, with high accuracy, adapt the model to a new domain by really just adapting the last sets of predictions that are generated. So what happens is that the underlying um, target domain and source domain end up training patient representations in the same way. And all you can do is you can just adapt, all right, the last little part that assigns weights and generates predictions of propensities and predictions of outcomes gets adapted to what my new domain looks like with the measures that are provided here versus in my original domain where you know the patient conditions were different and and so ultimately 
uh, techniques would say that I can't, I can't extrapolate treatment effect from one to the other. If I can do this, I can, I can actually even more complexly let the machine figure out who is similar and who isn't in terms of transportability, because what I can do is I can actually sort of split again these tasks out to estimate not only what is the outcome and the propensity of what's going to happen to you, but whether I can identify that you look similar or different from the other people in the data set. And so this sort of what we call domain adversarial learning, where um, I can start to estimate the likelihood of you looking similar to everybody and whether I can really believe generalizability findings versus, you know, if the model is very, very quickly able to differentiate that, that this individual looks different, then, then I can learn that from a transportability point of view, I need to do something different in terms of developing new models in this new patient cohort because there's just not enough overlap in terms of the amount of data that I have to learn from prior trials to these new individuals. And so, and so what I'm sort of going to conclude on here is that a lot of these divine and conquer approaches at the general level look like they still uh, provide the same sets of challenges of making sure that you have the right um, measures captured on individuals that you don't have impact from unmeasured confounders. Um, and says that you know, one of the challenges that we've had up until this point is looking at the average treatment effects and that through these neural net techniques, we are able to better divide and conquer and find sort of your, your digital twins, your, your individuals who look most like you and allow me to make better individualized treatment effects so that I can potentially look at individuals that are similar and look at super responders from treatments as well as non-responders or even perhaps adverse responders in what might even on the average look good, but might not work in all sort of corner cases here. And if I can do this, I can sort of better decide the benefits by matching you more closely to just a subset of people that similarly represent you through all of the sort of underlying generative distributions that I have that sort of pre-train all of my model techniques. And if I can do that, I can then potentially look at computational uh, phenotypes from these subsets of settings. And so this is uh, work from, um, from Yale separate to the CERCI group, but, but uh, has been looking at some of the similar things here of looking at trialed individuals and figuring out effectively through those techniques who I can match you to and who I can't, it's more of a continuous distribution. And based on this computational phenotyping, I can sort of figure out your regional neighborhood. And then within your regional neighborhood, I can look at the likelihood of outcomes and the likelihood of treatment effects. And by repeating this process over and over again, um, through these techniques, I can sort of simulate more generative what the data should look like and what the counterfactuals would look like to better understand your localized individual uh, treatment effect. And from there, potentially uh, unlock more power in observational data than, than I had at my disposal earlier when I was trying to figure out how to map this observational data to look like randomized control trial data. And if I can do that, I can, in theory, then uh, unlock the breadth of really big data techniques and, and wealth of electronic data that's gathered here and, and understand potentials for individualized improvement in single treatments, as well as dynamic multiple sets of treatments over courses of care um, when I'm perhaps in a setting that you know, that sort of data may not have been available to me earlier on. Uh, so as I said, I believe you have these slides at your disposal. So, uh, you know, this was just sort of a, a review of reviews, if you will. Um, so there's a, a decent number of um, citations here that really can drive home with a potential for what these big data techniques can do as data growth uh, continues and as we have more data available to us in observational settings and how we can trust what we're doing in those observational settings to look similar to the randomized settings and, and, uh, and obviously uh, available for uh, any questions, both individually on this talk and, and, and we're gonna have a Q&A for the group now to um, guide you to more references as well as uh, a deeper dive into maybe each of the big techniques themselves because really the, the promise here is, is, uh, is, is big, I, uh, we think. So uh, thank you for your time and uh, I'll go ahead and end my show here and open up for the group uh, Q&A.
Thank you so much, Dr. Matazavi. That was really super interesting. A lot of very helpful information. In fact, all the three speakers today are like are really, really amazing. I've learned so much and uh, now we're open for a Q&A. I saw there are multiple questions and comments in the chat box. Maybe I will start with Chris' question about multiplicity and maybe uh, William, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions and comments later. Uh, Chris' question is, when using multiple techniques, what do you think about issues with multiplicity? Is that a relevant consideration when using machine learning? Uh, so perhaps I will, um, I'll take this one first. I think, um, if I'm understanding correctly here, right, the, the issue here of, um, having multiple techniques and, and, and understanding the, the sort of differences that might come from using these different techniques and how you account for um, uh, what the final sort of outcome would be if they, uh, if they sort of contraindicate each other. Um, if I'm understanding that correctly, the, the, I think the thing that we've been thinking about as a potential promise here is that on a lot of these sort of ensemble based approaches to divide and conquer, they look at sort of the different mixtures here and look at waiting on how much I should account for different techniques that maybe arrive at different uh, outcomes and, and why they arrive at these different outcomes uh, in a way to sort of provide a better holistic view a probabilistic view and, 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 and an interpretation of what's voting across these methods to, to sort of give you a little bit more trust of why you would pick one versus the other or a, an average across the two or something like that. Yeah, let me uh, just add uh, on what Bobak just mentioned on the issue of <clears throat> multiplicity. <clears throat> so, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in traditional statistics, I think the idea of testing multiple hypotheses uh, with a chance that you might end up with a hypothesis that is barely based on chance or chance discovery. Um, in the machine learning sphere, it's a somewhat a little bit different, even though the same concept, the likelihood. In a, in a sense that in machine learning, you have the idea or the thing that we always call the bias variance trade-off. Uh, in the sense that you, 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 train, you can train a model and if that model, you look at the generalization error of the model, and the generalization error of the model is typically evaluated on a whole out test set. <clears throat> so, so much so that um, you try to reduce or try to reduce the, the issue of um, um, overfitting. If you're able to reduce the variance of the model, then you can be best assured that uh, regardless of the multiple model that you test, but with a small variance, then that model will be able to generalize to future examples. So it's that bias variance kind of, 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 of trade-off. And, and that goes to the issue that Boba mentioned about the ensemble, because it's been shown that by combining different models, you can, can actually come up with the best possible model that produce you the best or the smallest variance on your, on your, on your test set. But you know, with the advent of big data, it's always possible that when you have big data testing multiple hypotheses, you could always come up with some uh, discovery that is just by chance, not purely driven by the underlying um, uh, um, uh, data. And that's why we also really need to put into that framework of machine learning the idea of causal, causal, the causal learning. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add it briefly. I mean, I think the key point here is also the pre specification of it. That if we pre-specify a way and the decision rules around the multiple algorithms that are going to be either ensembled or be considered as alternative considerations, I think that can be addressed where machine learning often runs into problems is where it's more sequential, where we try a series of things and we're changing our assumptions over time, that can lead to a exaggerated multiplicity issue. Thank you, that's really helpful. And I wonder, uh, William, do you still want to ask a question? I saw uh, Dr. Manzavak, can we answer some of your questions there in the chat box? Oh, I had, I'll ask one of my questions. This is William, can, he, can people hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, so it seems to me that um, 
in uh, these machine learning models, like in traditional approaches, there, um, what you're talking about, you essentially have two model efforts underway, one to estimate um, assignment or assignment probabilities, and then another to estimate treatment effects. And so my my question was, if there are certain hospitals where the probability of, you know, say the fancier, newer treatment is zero, couldn't you, isn't that sort of half of a natural experiment so that you could at least keep those around to, uh, to get sort of controls? And if one thinks of an, an analogy with a, a case control design, so you could still match people that were similar to the to the people that got the fancy treatment out of that prop population in effect saying hey if they lived in the area where that where the fancy hospital was they probably almost surely would have gotten the fancy treatment the only reason they got the one they did is because they live where they live that's my question yeah so did, Sorry, Eric. Do you want to go first? I see you, on you, you can go first. for it. Yeah. Okay. No, I think I think that's a fantastic question. And, and so one of the subsided analyses that we looked at was actually really just the utilization rates of the devices and see how they change over time and where they change over time, because I think it's extremely fair to suggest that those regional differences actually do have a significant impact in outcomes modeling, uh, because you are in a place that has perhaps the newest treatment effects for uh, treatments uh, versus versus doesn't. Um, and and I think there's sort of a an interesting thing here of ultimately when I'm trying to predict an ultimate outcome, I think those variables uh, are proving to be more and more useful in terms of estimating what's happening and then potentially providing for you this idea that if you were in a different region where that was available to you and you looked like those other people that were in that hospital that had access to that, you would do better to help potentially guide transfer decisions. Um, but uh, but at least in terms of where we've gotten with the work so far, that's sort of a building towards that point. For now, we're sort of trying to look at it as two separate things of, in those cases where it's separate, how do I know how much impact that has on the outcome versus in the places where it's not, uh, can I do the same? So actually in that initial paper where we, where we pared it down, we'd had supplementary analysis where we didn't do that pairing down and saw uh, how much those differences mattered. Um, and you're still able to draw conclusions, but you know, you potentially have some, some questions there of whether it's, fair or not to per se. Thank you. And I think Jenny has a question and then maybe after that, Ray, how you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, sure. Hey. Thank you. Um, well, first, thank you for the fascinating presentations. Um, we, we're really enjoying the talks. Uh, my question is um, a unique feature for causality is tempor temporality. So the cause, the exposure occur first and subsequently there is outcome event. So this, this temporality, how, how are you taking to that account when it comes to modeling machine learning algorithm? How do, how do you take that into account? Let me, let me take this word. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that question. And the, I think your question was really one of the motivation for us to actually you know do this causal workshop because longitudinal data is challenging and you know is 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 hierarchical data uh you have you know dependency among treatment over time so when we apply we I mean, throughout this throughout this workshop you've heard all the three speakers in each one we've emphasized the issue of co-founding and selection bias and those same framework can be extended to longitudinal data. So at each, at each time point, you want to apply those assumptions. But in, in longitudinal data, as I mentioned in, in my talk, is that the treatment, the treatment is actually a co-founder by itself over time. So these are time um, uh, dependent um, uh, co-founders. So to be able to, at a given a particular point in time to predict whether the treatment at that particular point in time will be effective at some point in the future that's going to um, <clears throat> affect the outcome, you need to also account for past treatment. So in your potential outcome framework, that formula, 
you need to also look for the potential outcome at that current point in time, as well as a potential outcome for past treatments. That way, if you model in there, you'll be able to, 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 to address the potential trajectory in the future. To do that, there are methods that you can that can help you. And in, in the machine learning literature, I think the most efficient approach currently is a recurrent neural network because that models the correlation or the dependency of all those treatments over time. But you can also apply standard statistical methods like the mixed effect modeling. Uh, one of the study that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, research is that I do is I, I'm actually trying to use traditional statistical methods like the mixed effect modeling and integrate that into machine learning algorithm. It's a form form of an expectation maximization kind of experiment where I estimate a standard linear mixed effect modeling in one step and in the second step I um, uh, incorporate those estimates into a standard machine learning algorithm like FGB boost. But in a, in a sense that I want to be able to use that mixed effect modeling to model the correlation structure that exists among the repeated observation so that I don't have, so that I kind of minimize the bias of my estimate. So I, I, the, 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 the short answer that I would say is that we must model that time dependent um, treatment over time so as to be able to obtain accurate estimate of the um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, potential outcome trajectories. And there's also another thing that um, uh, other approaches have also been developed to account for is the hidden co-founders. There, there might be also hidden co-founders that are also time dependent. That even makes the whole issue much um, uh, difficult. And uh, I can give an example, try to give an example in one of the literature that I think Bobak cited is the, the time dependent co-founder. You take, for example, a patient that has um, uh, a diabetic patient. Uh, typically, they prescribe that patient a diabetic medication uh, a patient that is diabetic and both overweight. Typically, they'll prescribe the patient a diabetic medication and also a, um, a weight-lowering medication. But in the observational data, the, um, um, we never really observe the, 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 <clears throat> the BMI of the patient. You don't have the BMI in observational data. But the BMI is a, a confounder, kind of a hidden confounder that, that is related to both the treatment which is the medication that was prescribed, both medication, as well as the outcome, for example, A1C. And over time, you know, you have blood glucose that is changing. So you need to be able to model that changes over time to be able to estimate accurately the potential outcome. Thank you. Thank you. So Rehal, would you like to ask your question now? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so our uh, I'm from Chi's team. Uh, I'm a machine learning reviewer. So our team is working on a color inference problem in survival analysis. Uh, so it's a meta-analysis consisting nine different randomized trials. And uh, all the experiment drugs share similar uh, mechanism. So we call it uh, drug type A. And also there's the uh, control drugs. We call the uh, drug type B. Also the control drugs share uh, similar uh, mechanism, but it's different. Uh, compared to the drug type A. So this actually is a simple problem compared to the observational study uh, because uh, there are less confounding issue. Uh, so on average, the drug uh, type A is better than the drug type B, but based on our rationale, uh, we, we suspect there is a, a subgroup that um, the subjects has a better response to uh, drug type B so we want to identify that subgroup um, whose subject has better uh, response to uh, drug type B. So we build a, a model to predict the survival hazard of drug type A over drug type B. Uh, we validate our model uh, via the by trial data splitting strategy because we have nine different trials. So we hold down any eight trials for training data uh, for the training and the remaining trial is for our validation. Actually, we have 10 trials. Um, so the 10th the, the, the one is for the, the, uh, the final testing. So the validation performance is dependent on not only on the cross validation error of the training data set, but also the structure of the gradient boosting tray. We use the uh, gradient boosting method. So 
uh, based on my experience, I, I highly suspect that uh, there, there are covariate shift across different trials. And also the missing pattern uh, across different uh, trials is also different. That might be the reason to call this uh, instability because um, when the tree structure uh, shift, maybe we use different like uh, tree dips or the by tree sampling rate, the result is totally different. I mean, on the validating data set, even on the same validating data set. So maybe this is a, a, a issue related to machine learning robustness, but I, I still want a um, suggestion from the speaker. Uh, any suggestion would be much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting scenario. I mean, I think a few things I would immediately want to look at. One is, are there differences in the sensory mechanisms? Uh, we've seen this multiple times when doing meta-analyses with time to event outcomes, where especially if we're thinking about things like discrimination and calibration of a survival model, that the censoring, inter censoring distribution can impact those estimates. And so, you know, you may want to look at between the studies how the, the censoring mechanism varies. I, I think the other thing would be interesting to do is just build a propensity score model for the likelihood of being on one of these 10 studies, treat study enrollment and see what seems to predict study enrollment to pick up where there might be differences. Great, thank you. Um, do we have other questions in the chat box? Uh, Jenny, this is Chi. I have a question. I actually have two. Uh, the first one is for Dr. Lingfo. And Dr. Lingfo, you mentioned one of the challenges in causal inference is that the counterfactuals can never be observed or fully validated, but we want it to be um, as a plausible and perspective persuasive as possible. But how do we evaluate that uh, besides our domain knowledge and also all the validation and testing methodology? Do you have any other suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I like that question. And I don't think I have a very good answer for you, but I like the question. In a sense that, and I, I'm gonna put it on purpose and because I really want to draw from you guys that we need that domain knowledge. And I also want to call for the clinicians that are only clinician that is here. If you are treating your patient and you typically don't report your experiences, then that domain knowledge just simply lies with you. We probably want that domain knowledge to somehow go back to the electronic medical record, create that big data that somehow someday we might be able to learn on it. But yeah, so is uh, as I mentioned, the the the, the strong vulnerability condition cannot truly be validated using data. You need domain knowledge to be able to kind of validate that inference, as well as some knowledge about the causal structure and some techniques that have been developed in the. I, I did mention at the top that there are primarily two approaches for causal inference. We mostly target the potential outcome framework, but there's also a large body of research that have developed efficient techniques for validating causal model is a graphical model on which one type is a structural equation modeling. But in, in that thing, in that um, um, graphical structural modeling, there are actually theories that have been developed. And I, and I gave one talk in our research group here using the graphical models. Over there, the, um, there are techniques that have been developed in the realm of prediction that uses causal structure to develop a prediction model. And then that theory actually states, there are instances where if the theory fails, you have to abstain from making prediction. So you use that theory, you say, okay, well, I can use that theory and estimate whether my the, the 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 potential outcome will work or fail, but if it fails, then I abstain from making treatment effect estimation or I abstain from making prediction. So, um, the research is trying to combine the potential outcome framework and the causal um, graphical um, framework 
to be able to learn from both worlds. And that's something that I'm really super interested to be able to build a, a prediction model that can be used to infer causality and to be able to tell me that whenever I have a prediction problem on a data set, when to make prediction, when to make um, a causal um, estimation, or when to abstain from making prediction. I know this is probably not the right answer that you're looking for because I mean, I don't know if uh, Eric has a, maybe a better response, but domain knowledge as of now, domain knowledge is critically important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nimfo. That's very helpful, actually. Um, I have one more question, if I may, Jenny. <laughs> it's a little bit um, provocative and philosophical, but I am really interested to hear your inputs. Um, this is about sample splitting. This, uh, for me personally, I had some training in a few different fields, all related to use of uh, modern approach for like uh, decision making. And I, I noticed like across all the different fields, people are always stressing the importance of the independence of the testing data set versus the data used to train the model. This is true for um, machine learning, statistics, and also pharmacometrics, modern, et cetera. But in terms of the, the data that used to uh, select the model structure and uh, the, the data that is used for parameter estimation, there are some difference, differences. Uh, and it's on the emphasis of the importance of this separation. I noticed, uh, I think, um, uh, in machine learning and also I think in statistics as well, people are stressing like we need to separate the data used for select selection of the model um, and the, the data used for parameter estimation. But in some fields, this was not so stressed. And as well as the file testing, which is in some fields called the validation really works and then people are happy with it and then those fields are also very very successful so i'm just curious in your mind how important that separation of model structure selection or hyperparameter selection versus parameter estimation because i can imagine if we're doing a hypothesis testing question that would be very important to separate those two but when we are dealing with prediction type of questions is it that critical to have this type of um, sample splitting, sample splitting. Thank you. I appreciate uh, input from everyone. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me go first. Um, <clears throat> the in the prediction frame or even the causal frame, sample splitting is super super important. Just 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 to answer your question, it's super important. Let's just go in the prediction uh, phase. We, I know you've heard what we call overfitting. To define overfitting, overfitting is really a situation where you train your model and the model performs very well on your training set, but the model cannot recognize your, 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 your output on the, on the test set. So you need to be able to train your model so much it can generalize to examples, to new examples that it has not seen before. So sample speeding is super important in the prediction frame. So you're just concerned about prediction. Now in the causal framework, that's even more important. And I did mention about the honest estimation of the causal tree. This is this is this when 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 this method was 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 developed by Suzanne Athi, it, it was a game changer in terms of estimating treatment effects. Uh, I just give uh, what, what that actually honest estimation means. Typically, we build a random forest algorithm or causal um, um, decision tree algorithm, for example. You build your decision tree, and then what you're trying to estimate, you estimate the averages at the nodes of the tree. So you use the same tree, the same splitting strategy to estimate your outcome. But what if you use a different data, a different data to estimate that outcome? That is where honesty comes from. And it has been shown that by using honest estimation, you can reduce the variance of your, um, of your estimate. So in the, in the honest estimation strategy, I use one split data to estimate my tree or to build my tree, the splitting in that tree. Then I use a different sample to estimate now the treatment effect in my tree. So I build a tree, 
then I predict the tree on a new sample. It is on this new sample that I estimate my treatment effect. And due to the new treatment effect now, I show that that new estimate is um, less bias, is um, asymptotically efficient in the sense that among all estimators that are trying to estimate the treatment effect, my estimate has the smallest variance. It's the same thing with the targeted maximum algorithm because it's asymptotically efficient because it has the smallest bias. So the honest estimation is comes with the, um, uh, the, the splitting criteria, which which is which, which in the in the realm of causal inference because you can never really observe your um, uh, potential outcomes. You will want to use both machine learning techniques that are accurate and both a sample splitting technique that can give you the smallest variance as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Ningfor. I, I, I totally agree with you, the importance of detection of overfitting, but just please allow me to be a little bit provocative. So if there's really overfitting, and won't you be able to detect that from your testing data set? Because what I'm really asking here is, I, I totally agree. And I think the, um, I think there's just recently some machine learning best practice being published by RCVH colleagues where they also stressed down the testing data set, be independent about the data being uh, used for model develop or model training. But what I'm asking here is really about um, the data you use for model selection. In, in some field, it will be model structure selection. In some field, it will be like hyperparameter uh, tuning. Those are a, a kind of similar, that sets your model structure. And then that data and the data you use for parameter estimation. So if there's no adequate separation in this step, but we have good testing performance from that external, like the valid external validation set, will you be happy with that? Because I, I do know some fields that is their standard practice and they have been very successful as well. I mean, here, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a quick <laughs> controversial answer. <laughs> I, I, I'm all for sample splitting. I think it's a great idea if I had enough data. I've never been in a scenario where I had enough data um, and therefore, things like cross validation is what I'm always advocating for. I mean, I think I think it is important to have some sort of evaluation that is independent of the process. But I want to use all my data because I'm limited in the data that I have. Therefore, something like cross validation, default cross validation, or Monte Carlo cross validation, is what I've always recommended there. Thank you, Dr. Pauli. That actually, I think that really answers my question because <laughs> I also feel like really like torn between the two different philosophy. And I, I could understand some field exactly as you said, they want to use the data because the data is so precious and limited. They want to use it to the full extent. So that's why they use the data for the model selection as well as the model parameter estimation. But they, they do want to maintain the integrity of the testing data set to evaluate the final performance. So, so in your mind, in some cases, this is also acceptable, right? Thank oh, yeah. you. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, just 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 to add uh, uh, on what Eric said, you know, cross-validation, you really want to use your data because sometimes data is, is, is really expensive. Um, mm -hmm. but, but one issue to also keep in mind is that um too much reliance on um, cross-validation. It has been shown that cross variation can give you some form of optimistic results. If you have enough data, which, which can be expensive, but you can strive to have a whole out sample that was not used in your cross validation. For example, if you have an analysis that you're looking at, maybe a data set from 2010 to 2017 like we did, then I can hold out the last two years of my data set, which appears in the future, train my models on the previous years and then validate. So, so some kind of external validity, or if you have data set from a different institution, the even better. So you can actually do an external validation. And to be honest, in my experience, and when it goes to the papers that are submitted to like, 
JAMA or circulation, whenever they see that kind of an validation that use multiple institutions, and it's a good study, it goes. Because that's really like telling us that that model has been validated and that model will be able to generalize to external population that the, the model was not used to build. So I'm, I'm, I'm always in favor of such studies that can use some external data to validate the model. But oh, yes, uh, yeah. uh, this is uh, Thomas Brigon from ORI. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, um, thank you. Excellent presentations and excellent discussion. And I just want to chime in on that on that issue. I think that's a very important issue. Very often, you see um, works where the um, the initial variable selection, for example, that the variables that will go into the model are uh, is done on the whole data set, and and then. Uh, uh, and then you parameterize, you split the data set and you parameterize your model, but you have already selected. So, so the, the whole data, the, the model has seen all the data and there's, there's nothing. And, and obviously then when you do your AUC curves, those will be contaminated because you have selected uh, variables that you know have some kind of, have some kind of trend, right? So, so obviously there is contamination. And I don't know if there is a way, there, there is a way of accounting for that, but I've seen it not done. And I've seen, especially some of the contracts that we had, you have to be really careful because there's an incentive of making things seem, seem predict things uh, when, when, and you have exactly that case. And sometimes it's buried really deep in the, in the work. So I don't know if you can speak on how do you, Account, is there is there a formal way uh, of accounting for that contamination of of your information with with the trading data when you do uh, model selection? Is there a formal way you can bootstrap everything and you will you will see it? But I, I was wondering if there is a frequentist approach to this. I'm not aware of a easy correction, like bias correction value, other than just starting over. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, to be honest, I actually don't think I've seen I've seen one either. I, I see in a number of different ways in which people try to do the different cross validations or repeated cross validations, but uh, it's certainly nothing standardized. Yeah, I agree with. Movek and Eric, there is there is uh, you know, there is no formal way. I, you say machine learning is almost like an art. Is is like I mentioned at the end. We like what that interview that um, uh, <clears throat> Michael Jordan gave. We build things and we hope for things. To yeah, work. yeah. But the good practice would would be then to to really really keep the model. Uh, uh, really keep, keep the model selection clean of the of the validation data, right? I mean that philosophically, that's that would be the standard practice. That should be the standard practice. No, that's that's what I mentioned. I, again, we have to also maybe look at the trade off data sparsity, data um, uh, availability. Yeah, no, no, I get, what, I get what that. I get. What I really what I'm advocating for, and I always do that, is if you're able to collaborate with external partners to kind of use their data set. This is learning healthcare systems. If you can collaborate with external partners to say, okay, I've developed this model using this specific population. I want to see how this model will work on your population. I mean, that, that's the reason why we have this thing like PicoriNet, because we want to create a unified data platform that models can be tested on different. So we should be encouraging such validation of models. And your question is a very great question. Uh, cross validation is super um, based, um, uh, you know, baseline technique, but we shouldn't end there. Thank you so much, everyone. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your input. Thank you. So now I think it's close to the like the end of the <laughs> workshop. I will turn it back to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to wrap up, I, I want to thank you for the audience to tune in today. 
And I want to thank you, um, the Mayo Yale uh, Clinic team, to make this uh, talk possible. Um, thank you for the FDA colleagues um, in working on this. And uh, most importantly, thank you to the speakers. And uh, we're really looking forward to continue follow your research and the new development and to learn more about uh, the machine learning and the artificial intelligence. And thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good one. Thank you.